Stanford University. Well, welcome to this oral history of the evolution of physics at Stanford in the post-World War II era. But it's much more than this. It's a history of the growth of big science at Stanford and the creation and evolution of the interdisciplinary labs, or independent labs as they're known, which are highly accepted today, but it wasn't always that way, and much of it started in the physics community. My name is Mac Beasley, and I'm joined here today by Sandy Fetter and Sid Drell. We all played some role in this history, and I will act as moderator and contribute uh, where, uh, where I can. By way of background, let me emphasize, as I already said, a bit, the academic centers involving researchers from dif different disciplines is commonplace today uh, in many of most universities, and, um, uh, but it wasn't always so, as I said. And in the 1950s, in the physics department, the first independent lab at Stanford was uh, introduced. It was the microwave lab, and out of that came much of the evolution of the physics community at Stanford and also the independent labs, and it's that story that we'd like to tell today. Uh, as a part of that, uh, SLAC was formed, the Stanford Linear Accelerator, and that's a special case. SLAC is a national facility. It's more than an independent lab. It functions in the university really as a school. Its director serves on the dean's council. So it's, it's a, a much different animal in a way, and that's part of our story. So it's not only the independent labs, but it's big science and the creation of a national laboratory at Stanford. And our purpose today is to talk frankly about the various issues and problems that arose in this uh, creating these institutions, especially SLAC, how they were resolved, and in fact how the resolution is, in its, I think, uh, current form occurred rather recently, and uh, I think that'll be an interesting part of the story. So let me tell you now a little bit more about the three of us. Uh, first, <clears throat> understand that each of my colleagues here is on the panel has a very distinguished career. I will not embarrass them by listing all their, uh, recounting all their accomplishments and awards. It is important, I think, however, to indicate the things they did at Stanford through which they played a role in this evolution. The uh, eldest member of our group, the first to come to Stanford, was Sid Drell. He's a professor of theoretical physics emeritus at SLAC and a senior fellow in the Hoover Institution. Uh, Sid came to Stanford in 1950 as an instructor and then, I guess, was away a bit and came back in 1956 as a professor in the physics department. He helped found SLAC and served as its deputy director uh, until 1990. Well, he helped found SLAC in 1963 and, and held the position of deputy director until 1968. Sandy Fetter is a professor in physics and applied physics. Uh, he came to Stanford in 1965 when, the, in, in the physics department, he later joined, uh, got a joint appointment in applied physics. He served as chair of the physics department at a critical time in this evolution. He's also been chair of the faculty senate and associate dean of humanities and sciences and has been a director of two of Stanford's independent laboratories. I'm Mac Beasley, as, as you know, uh, came to Stan I'm the lat latest to come to Stanford, last to come to Stanford, and I came in 1974 as an associate professor in applied physics. I served as chair of the applied physics department, as Sandy was chair of physics department in, in one of the critical times that you'll hear about. Uh, and uh, with Sandy, I was one of the founding members of one of the more recent independent labs, the Jabal Laboratory for Advanced Materials. I was also Dean of the School of Humanities and Sciences an interesting time in this regard and helped in or participated certainly in the formation of the Clark Center, which I believe is one of Stanford's newest independent laboratories. So there's a lot of experience here and a lot of knowledge of the history and uh, we hope that you find this discussion valuable and I will now stop talking and uh, <clears throat> come to the, the substance of this. And as I said, it's really a story about post-World War II Stanford, but I thought maybe Sid, as our eldest member here, could say something about when he came, what Stanford physics was like and, yeah. and what were the, 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 yeah. the things that going back in history that were really led to some of this. Sid? Yeah. Well, I arrived, as you said, as an instructor in 1950, 
and stayed two years before I went back east and joined the MIT faculty and then came back in 56, so there's a gap there. But uh, the history as I know it is that before World War II, a, a key technical development was uh, being made in this area. It's called the, the Kleistron. And Bill Hansen, working with the Varian brothers, Sig and uh, uh, Russell. Russell, thank you. Russ, <laughs> uh, there, there were several reasons to be interested in making a high-powered tube to turn uh, ordinary electromagnetic uh, uh, currents into very high, intense, short pulses so that one could make uh, radars at, uh, in, in the microwave wavelength. One, one reason that Bill Hansen had great interest in was using those, uh, those power tubes to be able to have higher energy electron beams that could probe more deeply into nuclei for fundamental science. Some of the impetus for this, as I understand, came from mainly from Sig Varian, Siegfried Varian, because he is a pilot and thought that uh, a microwave radar on an airplane could help navigate above the Andes in bringing the mail <laughs> from Pan Am from South America. It's an example of how science and the practical applications often go together in technical advances. Anyway, they were making progress when they went off to war and went along with Ed Ginston to Sperry in, in New York and came back after the war and, and went hard back to work then, but came back also with Chattero, Mar Marvin Chattero, and they were a nucleus of making the microwave laboratory and developing a very high power micro uh, klystron so that one could uh, have not only more applications, it's fair to say that radar powered by magnetrons of the sort of cousin of the Kleistron, but the technology developed together was the thing that won World War II. Certainly won the Battle of Britain and finding German submarines in the Atlantic when they snorkeled won the Battle of the Atlantic. But it also made possible a linear electron accelerator that could jump far ahead of what had been possible in probing physics. And they uh, built, Hansen led the building of a, uh, I think it was a 10 foot long section that made something like four MeV electrons. And that was, a, that was the first step and immediately kindled uh, in 19, that, that was 1948. And that was done just before I came. Also tragically, just before I arrived as an instructor, Bill Hansen died. But uh, that technology brought senior people to Stanford. Already there was a very famous physicist, one of the uh, greatest uh, in my book of the 20th century, and that's Felix Bloch. Uh, uh, experimentalist from Penn, Bob Hofstadter came. Leonard Schiff, a theorist from Penn came. And, and they were building, and the idea uh, uh, to, to, uh, to build a 200-foot machine that could make 450 MeV, or half a GeV, electrons uh, grew. And that machine started, and a big, a big event happened in 51 when uh, Professor Panofsky, otherwise known as PEEF, decided to leave Berkeley when, when it became, the faculty became embroiled in a loyalty oath issue. Those days with the Un-American Activities Committees, uh, the legislation was passed that required all faculty members at the University of California to sign a loyalty oath. Peef, who had worked even as a very new PhD, it's significantly in the U.S. war effort, even finishing his graduate studies at Caltech, obviously had no reason not to sign a loyalty oath. He had proved his loyalty, he had signed them and been cleared for military work. But the culture of that, that was created at Berkeley, many of their best faculty members in science in particular, left other universities or were fired. And so Peep decided that was not the culture he wanted. And he came over to Stanford, which was a very great uh, uh, advance in this program. And uh, there was then the microwave laboratory, as you said, Mac, there now was the high energy physics laboratory, building a 200 foot accelerator. It's the one that did very beautiful experiments that Bob Hofstadter later won his Nobel Prize. Can I doing. ask you a question? Yes. I was in the microwave lab when I yeah. first came to Stanford, and I've always wondered whether, as, a, as Stanford's first independent lab, 
It yes. had faculty in physics and electrical engineering. Yes. Was there any controversy that you know of in the formation of that within the department? Not that I know of. No. Okay. It, so that it, was it, not it existed, controversial. Okay. And it did not. I mean, there, there were staff there. There were senior research associates, right. faculty working there. And that was fine. There, there was no, no controversy there. Uh, Peef uh, turned that machine into a great uh, machine to do experiments with. Experiments were done. And then... Uh, just before I returned, I, when I, I, I had seen California and Stanford, I saw the future that Fred Terman and people like that were building. And although MIT was a very attractive place, <laughs> I had fallen in love with the Golden Gate. I, I, was, I, I was told that the microwave lab was originally in the old physics building. And that it was in maybe the quad. in the quad, in Jordan maybe. Hall, yeah. and then it eventually yeah. moved to a separate That's building. That's right. And I don't know when that happened. I know that there were there were things going on in the physics building between fifty and fifty two when I was here. Okay. Which, well, which the, the old building to, to which it went was just torn down. Yes. yes. What? Was the, a year was ago the or so. Math building. Yeah. Oh no! But the no, original no, the, was the math corner. Yeah. Then they yeah. when they came over to yeah. the the yeah. what I knew as the well, microwave lab instant. and is will now be the. Yeah the bioengineering yeah. building in the new quad. So yeah. it was there a long, long yeah. time. As it got bigger, it sort of migrated into bigger like space. Like Topsy, it just grew. And then, yeah, and then so. they, of course, needed a special building for a 200-foot-long uh, uh, rifle shooting electrons at the speed of light, almost. Well, I'm, I'm glad yeah. to, to hear that it was not controversial. There was no controversy thing. that I knew of. There were, there were appointments there. Yes. Uh, uh, but uh, this, the, the seed of what will be a controversy You'll see. Uh, yeah, no, no, I know that part. That. But also, yes. the the it was at that point, as I read the yeah. history, that the it was instituted that these independent labs would report to, and then it was yes. the dean of research. Yeah. That's so right. that was the first non-school. There, there was a. The, that's right. There were independent labs going to the. But that then was the first. The the success, the terrific success, of that two hundred foot linac, uh, whetted appetites. For even grander things, and uh, yeah, okay. the uh, uh, and so th that it started by the time I came back, and people uh, like uh, Hofstadter, Panofsky, Schiff, and Felix Bloch all were had their eyes set on a major, major machine that would push the technical limits as far as they felt they could, and also could be constrained within the ge geographic boundaries of Stanford territory, <laughs> and that led to a plan for a two-mile-long accelerator from 200 feet to 10,000 feet, from half a GeV to uh, 20 to 50 GeV. And so the plan started going. And at that point, all the ideas were, this was so big, it was not going to be part of the physics department. We saw in the perspective of 1956-57, which I shared, that... Uh, Berkeley had become a very big physics department, but the Berkeley Radiation Laboratory, which had the big Lawrence cyclotron there, was such a big thing that many people felt it made the physics department lopsided and too large. And you could not absorb slack into the physics department or even into an independent lab at, uh, really serving the physics department. It was much too big. And it was, well, was there any sense, though, that if something was that big, it had to be a national facility? Yes. Oh, that, that it was understood that this was this was this was going to be the largest scientific project of the government in and when it was authorized in 1962, 114 million dollars in 1962. So it was going to be an independent laboratory. It was going to benefit from the association with Stanford. But it was going to be independent. And then the question was, how do you staff it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, it was going to do physics. But the physics department understood they, if you wish to say, owned the topic of physics for teaching at Stanford. And that, uh, you know, that having this machine would be great to do research at. In fact, the initial attitude of some of the faculty at that time was, you know, we're going to get this machine built, and then we're going to use it. That's the way the high energy lab that's had been the way, run. That's what I always heard Apple. about Bob Hofstad. He was explicit and, and on that. And he finally sort of got so angry when he wasn't yeah. going to have control. But no, but Bob Hofstadter had, I mean, the machine had been, the 200-foot machine had been built into a machine equipped to do experiments. 
Bob Hofstadter had designed his spectrometer, and he did his physics, and the machine provided him his, his uh, beam whenever he wanted it. Nobel Prize. This was a national laboratory, and, it, and the first controversy was, uh, how do you staff it? I mean, there were many examples of, not many, there was at least one example of a machine that got going in Cambridge, Massachusetts around that time. It was the Cambridge Electron Accelerator. And they hired a staff to build it, and it was used by the faculty of MIT and Harvard. Yeah, right. uh, this machine was so big, that could not be done. And it was certainly the, the, the uh, con commitment of, of, of Panofsky and my, myself as the two original physics professors involved that we believed that if we're going to get this machine, the, the, the monster it was called then, before <laughs> Slack, built and make it run well and be an outstanding, successful machine, the caliber of people who were going to be able to build that were going to be the caliber of people who were in experimental and applied fields, professors at major universities, not people who were just going to come as research associates. We had to assemble a team. And how do you get people who are professors at Harvard or MIT or Caltech or Cornell, you name it, to come to Stanford? You don't get them by not calling them a professor. And so the issue of professorships in Slack was the first big struggle. And this was a new problem. It was a new problem. Where was, this, was the university going to create professors? And what, was their, what were their privileges going to be? You can call somebody a professor and have, give him no privileges. Uh, uh, he's, he'll still be second class. And that, so, there, if fight number one, it was really a, a, a battle, was creating professorships. And uh, this, Fred Terman then said, I understand the point. There will be professors at Slack. Not professors of physics or anything, professors at Slack. And that's when it became a school. Uh, I don't remember the day. Well, I mean, in, in spirit. But in, in spirit, it yeah. did. Was yeah. this around but, 1960? Yeah, oh, yeah. This, this, uh, we were now in 19... It's, it's, it's the date I couldn't find in my notes, but it certainly was, was uh, uh, the existence of the rank of professor was there in 1960. Okay. I know it was there in 60. Uh, and so uh, we thought that uh, one could, uh, you know, we had to write down, because there had been tough feelings in creating the professorship, you know, what were their privileges and what were not their privileges. And the physics department made it very clear. They own physics. Teaching at physics was their sole responsibility. Now, I have to say, on the physics department side, because I had seen this in terms of staffing, uh, it's, it's always a tough fight to be able to get billets and, uh, uh, out of the administration, because they cost money. That's a commitment university for, for a new uh, billet. Um, the uh, physics department understood very rightly that the only way they had a real leverage in getting billets was saying the teaching demands more people. And if Slack were allowed to do the teaching, that would take away their strength. Now, some departments were willing, and I don't think, I'm not giving an editorial here, to say that you have part-time teaching and get part of your salary from government contracts. The physics department did not believe in that. They had every reason and right not to believe in that. But that put them in the position of saying they owned all teaching. Now, that was something that was settled. It wasn't easy. Yes, all courses would be taught by the physics department, graduate and undergraduate. But then, what about graduate students? If you call somebody in physics a professor, and he can take graduate students and, and work at Slack, but you call the Slack professor one who can't have graduate students, then he's not a first-class citizen. And so recruiting a professor to Slack and then saying you cannot supervise graduate students was not an acceptable position for us. That was battle number two, and that was a very, very painful one during 62 and 63, because, uh, you, you know, you, you have a, a big new operation sort of 
in a certain sense, people feeling overwhelming and existent one that had a very valid culture, had very high standards, and basically, basically it was like Noah's Ark in the sense there were two professors for each field of physics. And but, but, but let me ask you, though, this must have had some, I don't know, I've always been curious, this must have had something to do with both the physics department and the people like you and, yeah. and Peef who created Slack, that high energy physics was the most important field at that time in physics and both wanted that because yeah. you could, the physics department could have said, well, we'll go into these areas. Yeah, yeah. I'm not saying that's what they it's should have done. It's a good point. No, yeah. no, Max, it's a good point. High energy physics was and still is a very glamorous subject. You know, it has what are we made of? How did the universe start? It's the most, it's, it's, the, it's the easiest way to sound like you're doing very basic things. Well, the astrophysicists would argue that. No, point, no, right? I, no but <laughs> at the moment. I know, I understand. At the moment, no, they, they would, I would argue that you can't distinguish one of the great successes of modern science is that particle physics and astrophysics are joined closely now yeah, yes. because the concepts developed in, in particle physics have given some guidance to astrophysics and what they are learning we'll in astrophysics We'll come back to this because, uh, yes. as you know, uh, yeah. astrophysics and, sort of came very, out of applied yeah, it's physics. It's a key point because later you're going to get to discuss the applied physics yes, department. Right. And there was no problem with physics shedding applied physics. No, that's and, right. And, but this was clear in the discussions. Yeah, that, uh, that, that's fine. You have your way of life. You can have your contracts supporting your teaching and so forth. But they didn't want to let go of high energy physics. Right. But the but, physics had already diversified in some sense because they brought Fairbank and then Bill Little yes. in low temperature physics. Yes, but right. not. And they already had atomic physics with Art Shallow. That's right. And the reason they hired me because they wanted a theorist yeah. in low temperature yeah. physics. That came a little bit later, though. I no, think. but I mean, the, Fairbank came in '57, yeah. and Bill Little came in '59. Yeah. Yeah. No, but I think the, I think the the they yeah. did have a. But they uh, they never I, had but, solid state physics. No, well, they, they had Felix, who sort of created the field. But he didn't like the field. Well, we'll, we'll come to that. But <laughs> yeah, that's no, fascinating. But you see, your point is correct. They that, that's the Noah's Ark principle. They want <laughs> no. They they wanted to be cover all fields. I mean, they had very good intentions and very good principles and have a pair in each field. But a pair in high energy physics wasn't going to be a, but a small part of the slack effort. And so, um, I mean, clearly there would be a certain, it's understandable with a big monster, hundred million dollar coming in, you're going to be somewhat paranoid. You're going to lose something important that you don't want to lose. Yeah, no. I, Can and, I come back to the graduate yes, students yes. briefly? Because when I came here and I don't know when it started, all of the graduate students who worked at SLAC were, were admitted by physics. Yes, SLAC that's never still had, true. But I mean, there was a big issue of controlling the numbers of yes. students oh, who yeah. could work out at SLAC. Yeah. And eventually, see, you eventually got to the point where you said, it took years where you would say that any, any, yeah. any faculty member yeah. at SLAC is an appropriate advisor, but it used to be highly controlled and you had to get layers of well, permission. You're coming to that. Okay. <laughs> That's, All right, I'm no, jumping We're ahead. dealing with the 61, 63 okay. establishing. You're talking about the battle in 65 <laughs> right, and I the final know, stage I in 72. Know what all this was. That's, so. No, 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 no. So, but, but you know that the that's that's how eventually uh, the so there was a fight defining what were the what were going to be the the size of the slack faculty compared with physics. What were going to be the the, were, were any graduate students going to be allowed to work there or not? Because without, if, if the university said, we're going to let you have professors at Slack but no graduate students, that's an empty, that's, that's an empty offer. Nobody's going to come. And so that, that had to be settled. And uh, the, the crucial date of that being settled was a meeting in 1962, May 23rd, 1962. I remember that date like I remember the ride of Paul Revere. <laughs> <laughs> you know, May 23rd, after many, many memos that went back and forth, back and forth, and uh, what were going to be, uh, how, you know, if there were exceptional cases where physics graduate students could work with slack faculty, you know, how did it happen? You know, you had to, the procedures existed. You had to, once, once a year, the physics department would meet and decide who was going to be allowed, how many were allowed to work at SLAC. 
And so you have to have all that in shape by May 15th for what you're going to do next year. And there was a lot of discouragement <clears> of <throat> students, and, uh, and students felt somewhat harassed. The number of students that could be working at SLAC was going to be less than 10 percent. All these conditions were there. And, and uh, finally, uh, on uh, May 23rd, the physics department took a, a major step. P, P was on the scene. I was on um, my Guggenheim at uh, CERN at that time, and but commu 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 no, communicating back and forth. And that was when I told Peef, Peef, I'm not going to stay a professor in physics and try and com and try and uh, uh, hire colleagues to build the faculty, particularly the theoretical physics faculty, which. I, I felt very strongly about um, that being my, my, my field uh, and, and tell them I can have graduate students, but only in an exceptional case, they might have one or so. I can't live with that. So you have to tell the physics department that if they vote for that, I'm out. I will give up my appointment and take a slack appointment. Ah. And that was a that was a statement. And uh, and uh, uh, Peef eventually in, in the May 23rd meeting, Peef wrote me about it. You know, he was very discouraged, the, the, temp, the, the temper of the discussion. People saying, well, you know, how could you, you can't be a director of Slack and a professor of physics at the same time. And nobody, nobody even said that was what Peef was and that he could be. I mean, there was, a, it, it, the, the, the discussions went out. Yeah, I, I think we spent enough time on it. But let me just say, uh, that was the moment that, uh, uh, we, we, we reached the decisive crossing of the Rubicon. Now, uh, the, the battle went on still for several weeks and months. And eventually, I got a letter from Peef saying, Sid, I finally agree with you. I'm going to have to resign my professorship. So then the and, two and of and you so went to January, he started. I, did, I, I was on sabbatical. I came back after uh, being a year in CERN and spending the fall semester as Loeb lecturer at Harvard. I don't think you were there yet at that point. Uh, I was there 60 to, I left in the summer of 63. Well, I, and I was I there came, in the fall. I, went, I, I, I was there in the fall of 62. Okay. Okay. I was a love lecture. Giving, uh, well, I was doing the my thesis lectures. work That's right. then and no, I, I went to Berkeley. I was, I was doing the love lectures and talking to all the Julian Schwinger's graduate students who could never get to see So you, you were not then here at Stanford during this? No, no. no, no, no. I didn't come until mm -hmm. 1965. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, I was going to yeah. say, I'll just comment yeah. now, when yeah. Paul Martin and other people, when I was considering yeah. an offer from Stanford, Paul, I talked to Paul yes, a lot, and yes. he said, you know, you really need to be cautious because there's a huge fight between physics and slack, and you don't want to be caught up in it. Well, I got the same advice when I came in 1974 from the same gentleman. <laughs> yeah, the point is that the, <laughs> we'll come back to that. The, the reputation of Stanford on this was being hurt. Oh, yeah. yes. And yeah. it went on. And that was only the beginning yeah, of when I it know, was being hurt. Another 10, 10. So anyway, but, 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 but before, just to let the me, let me yeah. But I, I'm curious, maybe you know Sid or Sandy just from talking to people later, what was the view in the physics department of the faculty who were not in high energy physics about all of this? Was it just consuming everything, or well, was there some? Or do I honestly you know? don't know. It, again, when I came here, I was told that Felix Bloch had been the first director general at CERN right. for a year, yeah. probably in the late 50s. Yes. And he came back and said he hated the idea of dealing with big science. Yes. Now, whether that's okay. true or not. Yeah. And he also, the myth I was always told is what you mentioned that yeah. they held up Berkeley as an example where more than half the faculty were basically high energy from, from the yeah. Lawrence Berkeley yeah. lab, and that was just unbalanced. Yeah. And so that was part of the, the history yeah. of why it was yeah. so yeah. fractured. Yeah. Uh, look, when I came as an assistant professor, you were a peon. Uh, I was told the letter from Leonard Schiff, I still have it, it said, although tenure is not ruled out, it's highly unlikely and should no way be anticipated. And you had three years to be promoted or leave. And, and it's only when I had two offers in hand from other universities that the department finally was willing to, to vote for it. It's, it, wouldn't have been, it wouldn't have happened, I'm sure, without Dirk Walechka who really, we've, we spent a lot of time talking about physics, and, and so that was a big thing. But as an assistant professor, 
for three years, you were, I like to think was like Victorian England where everyone knew his or her role. And you wouldn't, you wouldn't even think if you're a, if you're a field worker, you wouldn't think of questioning. And you were never involved in faculty meetings. You were just literally your job was to do research and write papers, which I did. I spent a lot of time on that. But I have no idea. I mean, Bill Little was a little impolitic and he sort of, he was always willing to tell you what was going on, but nobody else will. And, and I, never, I never got to speak much with Bill Fairbank or Bob Hofstadter in those days. Well, it's, it's always been interesting to me. I mean, any great physics department has strong personality. Yeah. That's yeah. a given, right? So there's yeah. going to be tension. That's a given. Yeah. But I think it was the combination of that and the emergence of big science. I mean, that was yeah. a lot of load to take. Yeah. So it, I think... Yeah. You know, we, we, you can have one view or another of the history, but one has to be charitable. That was a no, big, I, I'm big trying set to be of changes. No, 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 I didn't mean I, that. Yeah, well, I'm, yeah. I'm thinking of yeah, our, yeah. our listeners that this, these were momentous yeah. changes yeah. Yeah. In, when, in physics. When we get to the 70s, I mean, there was a lot of tension between Hofstadter and Fairbank, I'm told. And yes. that's another yes. set of stories. Yes. And we'll, that's relevant later. We all have these problems. You have strong-minded faculty, good scientists. But this was one which had a strange nature. It was one group who under, operating under a, a principle whereby really there were, there were several dominant voices. The physics department was really run like the old European system. Yes. You, no, Felix wondered, Block yeah. had to agree. Well, it was basically the Block period. and Schiff were the appointment yeah, committee. That's right. And, they were, and it was unanimous. And, you had to have yeah, un that was unanimous. the other terrible yeah. thing that you yeah. had. Every appointment yeah. was unanimous. Yeah. Yeah. It had to be unanimous, yeah. well, and that led to some black ball situations, which were tragic. Well, I, again, I don't want to... Uh, the physics department, as far as I'm concerned, had every right to do what it wanted to do its way. <laughs> and I didn't leave them because I didn't like the way they were doing their work there. Well, it was their insistence on making sure what the new slack faculty was not allowed to do. Yeah, no, what, that the, was what yeah. was the unreasonable part. Well, Sandy and I had uh, exposure to this bit of the history when yeah. we come to the uh, rapprochement. But, yes. uh, but uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm pleased, at least, well, how would I put it? Uh, I've always felt that there was a kind of European style to it, the it, physics it, department. It, this and that point, was Felix. I that's right. Presume, that's exactly a, right. Yeah. Felix, you know, again, you hear the names of Schrodinger and all these other people. Yeah. My respect for Felix as a physicist is enormous. Oh, what he, can in, you in say? In so many right. fields, he really is one of the supreme giants of 20th century physics. We agree. And I was a very close to him. When I came as an instructor, I used to be at Felix's house every Friday or Saturday night playing piano violin sonatas with him because he played piano and I played violin. And we were very close. So personally, what I'm talking about was very painful because after the, when I came back, I, again, we were very close until the slack business came up, but we were on opposite sides. And I have to tell you, until about a year before he died after that, we never talked. He didn't want to, it was, then I wrote a paper with Mal Ritterman on slowing down of magnetic monopoles mm -hmm. because someone thought in Berkeley they'd seen them. And Felix was so interested in this, he called me up and we had a couple of conversations working at the backboard. But it, that's how, how, how painful this was. But uh, my respect for Felix was enormous. Okay. Well, but he, was, I became, he was always, for me, a terrifying figure. But the one time I remember giving a yeah, talk once, yeah. and, and, and he, asked, he was there and he asked yeah. some questions. It had to do with, with slowing down through phonon emission. Yeah. And then he, he called me into his office. He said, please come down to my office on the next morning. Yeah. And I went down and he thought about it. He said, you know, this is actually like some work I did years ago. Mm -hmm. and, and he proceeded to tell me yeah. and it was a brilliant idea. Yeah, yeah. So I was, I was actually, that's no, the, yeah. the most close yeah, interaction yeah. I ever had with him. But well, he was I, amazing. I, I always found it ironic that Stanford, which was then certainly a very famous place mm -hmm. in physics, had this European style. Okay, I mean, I, I associated it in my own, this is when I was at Harvard, I, I always thought of it as, as Felix's influence, and he was a great man for sure. But here, it, it, the irony yeah. to me was, here you are in America, on the West Coast, yeah. which is about as, as yeah. culturally yeah. as far as yeah. you can yeah. from Europe, yeah. and I think probably there was some price yeah. paid for that, because yeah. the way the appointments yeah. were made, in Europe you had these very strong it's figures. Very, you know. 
But here, if you're a professor, at some yeah. level, everybody, yeah. you know, everybody's no, the, the, out the same, and it, it's, a, it's a mismatch. Is, my, that, is that unfair, do you no, think? No, it's not unfair. Yeah. The greatest era of university development in this country, as far as I know, was uh, really right after World War II. Yeah. When all, so there was, well, talk only science. Yeah. That's all I can talk. When so many scientists came to this country, science had done so well, science was being supported, and the universities, most of them, just managed to grow around the senior people who became somewhat arcane in their way of doing things. Yes. Stanford didn't. Well, at some point. But eventually, it, we would, and when we get to your period later, and when Felix is retiring, then it did. But for, for this decade we're talking about, yes. Felix ruled as if he was the hair professor yes. of a German university. Yes. I mean, eventually there was a visiting committee in the late, probably the early 80s, and I remember one of their major roles was that one of the powerful things about American universities yes. is unleashing the creativity yes. of all the faculty, yes. including right. the assistant professors. That's right. yeah. And that's when Walter Meyerhoff led the department into a system where you had a seven years to get tenure, and they no longer yeah, assumed yeah. that you wouldn't get tenure. They would only make appointments if yeah. you thought they had a high yeah, chance yeah. of getting tenure. No, so, and I remember yeah, those yeah. phrases particularly about yeah. the unleashing the creativity yeah. of everybody yeah. and having everybody yeah. participate. It's, so, it's fascinating. But complete your yeah, story about complete, Slack. Yeah, right. so I want to complete it. So, so just uh, let me be clear. I, th the physics department could run its own way. The problem was they wouldn't let us run our way. And it'll, it'll come out in 65 and 72 again, but just let me finish this sure, period sure. now. And so uh, eventually Terman and, and Sterling ruled that, uh, you know, that uh, there, there were going to be graduate students doing theses at, at SLAC. And uh, they still had uh, rules that you had, to, you know, a co-signer in the department, your research student couldn't take a reading course with you to get ready to do the research because even though it wasn't listed in the catalog, it, it was like teaching a course in physics. I mean, all these things, they went on through the 60s. And we, we, we but uh, the, in practice, we managed to uh, begin uh, growing our faculty and we managed to uh, uh, begin to develop a uh, standard of getting graduate students to work with us even though they were co-signed and there were always someone who would co-sign it but there were great delays so the fight went on but the principle that there would be graduate students getting theses at slack was established then when we get to phase two which is 63 to 65 and still stage three and 72 how that was administered becomes still a problem but the physics department had to be assured they owned the teaching of physics. I know shortly after I uh, left the department, some students asked me to give them a one-unit seminar on just concepts of modern physics. I forget what it was. And I said, well, I'll, I'll be glad to do that, you know, one evening. And uh, the fact of the matter is, uh, somehow or other, the students got that into a list of courses uh, <laughs> and, 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 all, and, and that was when Block and Schiff stormed into the president's office, and this had to be canceled. Yeah, we couldn't do it. That's, and what happened? Uh, I, I talked to the students without credit and, uh, on my own time, but, which I, but, uh, but that, that, that couldn't be because I was using the word physics. I mean, it was the rigidity of that that made this unnecessarily painful mm -hmm. thing. But uh, I came back. I, I, I started to say before, so let me just complete it. Uh, I came back to Stanford in January 63, taught Physics 51. That was my teaching, because I'd been away on sabbatical. I owed a year to the department, and, uh, and I was gone. University transferred my appointment. This line. Peace, and transferred, and, and, and we got going. Now um, we can take a little break and, <laughs> and, uh, and, and close that, and then we'll start Chapter 2. <laughs> Well, it's interesting uh, a little bit that uh, I was, like Sandy, considerably younger yeah. than these people. <clears throat> and, uh, uh, but there, I mean, I was on the East Coast, both as a graduate student at Cornell and then and the faculty at Harvard, and the, the, um, 
our colleagues yeah. in the East were aware of a lot of this, and uh, there was slowly yeah. building yeah. Uh, perception of problems of, at well, Stanford, which which we'll come to. Well, I don't we, know whether this was the same incident that you talked about teaching, but if, I got tenure in the summer of 68, and soon after I got tenure, there was this issue about your teaching a course. I remember. That, uh, maybe 68 was always. Because I, I remember sitting in as a newly tenured faculty member sitting in Leonard Schiff's office where the faculty was small enough that everybody could fit in. And basically, you were, you were asked, it was like taking a Boy yeah. Scout oath. You were asked to swear to fight for physics against slack to the death. I mean, I thought it was so childish, I couldn't believe it. It made such a huge impression on me, and I couldn't believe these were adults. Well, it, it, I have to... A, a perception of, of, of some of the thinking in the in the physics department at the time. I mean, when I was a dean of H and S, it was a time of financial difficulties, and uh, the 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 faculty thinks in terms of billets. Yes. Okay. True. And uh, <coughs> I learned <laughs> and tried to communicate to the, <laughs> the departments. It has nothing to do with the number of billets. It has to do whether you have the money behind the billets to do what you yeah. want. There's no nece not necessarily any correlation, and I don't, maybe Stanford ran its business differently then. But so I kept trying to tell the departments, and maybe it would have been good if this this notion had been here then, here at the, at the in these in that period, is that if you have good ideas, the university yes. will do everything it can. Yeah. And Slack, in some sense, is an example of that. Okay, that. You're going to create the positions to do what they yeah. think is the yeah. most, the yeah. best for the institution in science yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. But the faculty don't understand will, that to this day. <clears throat> I will say, one of, to me, one of the best things about Stanford, and very unusual compared to many universities where I've been on visiting committees, is the idea that it's the bubble up philosophy, that the, the yeah. administration yeah. listens yeah. when the faculty really, yeah. really want to make something yeah. happen. Yeah. And it's not decided on top and then yeah, thrust no, down people's throats. And deans don't like to and, say no. But it's always, I mean, my impression, it's always been that way at Stanford, and it's remarkable. The, the genius of Stanford, going from a, a very nice uh, private uh, university on the West Coast with good standards, but not a great player in the world of learning, to what it did in such a rapid time was the willingness, the insistence of Sterling and Terman and uh, uh, board of trustee chairman like David Packard and whatnot to say we are going to grow, we're going to become great, and the way you do it is that if there's an obstruction, you just grow around it. <laughs> and that's how, for example, the medical school. You you wanted to get great people, you wanted biochemistry, you wanted bio this or that and that, you go get Kornberg or Letterberg or Paul Berg and give them a new department. You didn't have to squeeze them into a department. Well, that's I mean, the that's, story I mean, of applied innovated. physics, too. We'll come to that. They innovated. Uh, they innovated. Okay. I'm going to finish your Slack story. And well, then... I'm ready now to go to say, phase two, 1965. Okay. okay. Go ahead. So there's now a lot of rumbling. The, the lines have been set, but there's a lot of rumbling. And it would do good if I just read a few paragraphs. You let me from Please. letters President Sterling was writing to say. And they, so here it is a letter to the head of the physics department. In May 19th, 1964, I have thought more about the matters we discussed. In this connection, I have reread my letter to you of June 15th, 1963. That letter seems now, as it did then when I wrote it, a straightforward statement of an equitable and viable arrangement. I do have, however, a continuing concern about the implementation of procedures for admitting students to the PhD candidacy, a responsibility of the physics department. You have to understand it had already been made totally clear, although one toyed with the idea, you weren't going to have a separate admission to high energy physics. A graduate student coming to physics shouldn't know that he wants to be a high energy physicist. If he knows that much, he doesn't know physics. He's got to <laughs> learn physics. It made no sense to say, if you want to be a high energy physicist, apply to the Department of High Energy Physics. We didn't want that. And so it still was had to go through the physics department for students. And we agreed on that was the only way it would be. As of the moment, the seven or eight students who will proceed toward their PhD under supervision of a slack 
member have been accommodated, accommodated. But two or three of these were delayed for from six to nine months, even though uh, there may have been some extenuating circumstances. Uh, I should very much like to have you take the leadership, he's right to let it, in having these issues addressed. And it you know, just goes on. No, the system's not working very well. This is in 65. This is in May 19th, 1964. Okay. It's That's pretty the, amazing that Sterling was that, had to be that involved yes. in the nuts and bolts. Yes. Because he had lots Simpler of other times. things to be interested yes. in. <laughs> Absolutely. No, no, he this, this, had no idea how many faculty meetings there were, memos back and forth. A year later, July 30th, 1965. That's more than a year later. Again, Sterling writing to both Schiff and Panofsky, and I'll read just here. Early in this year, I asked Professors Panofsky and Schiff to establish a joint physics slack committee to discuss the relationship between the two faculties. And Hofstadter, Meyer, Hoff, and Schiff on one side, Peef, Drell, and, and uh, Matt Sands, deputy yeah. director on the other side. Uh, I understand that the committee met on March 9th, he's writing now in July, and perhaps subsequently, but that the discussions were inconclusive. Yeah, it's just to see, <laughs> this is what's going on. This is the president of the university here on this because things are going nowhere. <laughs> and, uh, and so, it, you know, the feelings were bad. The uh, people, there was no trust between people. The numbers were low. And... Uh, you couldn't, uh, as I said before, if a student thought he wanted to work with you, uh, the best way to get it, I mean, from my own graduate student, you take a reading course with the professor and learn and see how you get along. Couldn't do that. Can't give, can't give credit if you're not a slack professor and the courses in the, in the, uh, the bulletin of courses and uh, degrees, and which we weren't allowed to do. We weren't allowed to, to write these are courses we're giving for our own education out at Slack. There's no credit that goes with them. We couldn't put that in the, we couldn't put that in the, the bulletin of courses and degrees. I mean, it's the it's the smallness of these things that are going on that is just so un, you know, it, it was tough. Life was tough on these things, but that's the way, that's the way it was. And um, then there was interesting thing that uh, the graduate students oh. The, 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 the graduate study department, uh, the, the division uh, sort of got, got caught up because in particular two students wanted to come with me. So I had a problem with two students, Treffel and Parsons. That was finally resolved. But uh, there's one thing, bear with me a second while I get a, um, a uh, oh yeah, then the issue now comes up now that starts the, 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 the I'll, I'll end the second one just to show you guerrilla wars going on, but the size of the faculty. The slack were, faculty. The slack faculty. So essentially they were to be eat the same size, physics and slack, 2020. That what happened was slack is it's working its way up and the physics department appointments were stalled at that point. This is now 65, so I mean it's still under the old system. And it was the physics department was interpreting the agreement of, you know, essential same size as being that if they have only 13 people, we can have only 13 people. So in other words, their policy of adding faculty was, but they insisted, imposed a ceiling on our faculty. And so that started another round of problems. Essential equivalence is fine. And also, we wanted to make assistant professors. that We had not had assistant professors before, just associate in full. And so we agreed, you know, the same number on the professoriate, essentially the same number, but it doesn't mean n equals n. It could be n and n plus one or n minus one, because when we make an appointment, have an opportunity, it's to meet our demands for growth, and physics had to have its schedule for growth. So the issue of whether the numbers were exactly equal or not became an issue. So there's no resolution, but this just was to show you how the guerrilla war is still going on and, and, and taking time and energy involving the president of the university or whatnot. And finally, let me just, I mean, there, there's little more to add in 72, except that um, 
the uh, it, it it gets personal at one point, but it again it just shows you what's happening. But um, uh, let me uh, that so and got to be more precise, since 1971 is when the um, let me get my facts straight because I want to have a reference for everything I say, and that is that. Uh, I read my notes. Yes, I can read my notes. The slack was growing. That's when we wanted the assistant professorships. And uh, the uh, interpretation of Sterling's 1963 letter then became uh, 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 the great concern. And named it. It's just a repeat. Physics owns the teaching. All physics credit courts, courses are theirs. Uh, as a matter of policy, I shall expect the principle of parity to be essentially maintained. This is Wally Sterling. I say essentially because it is only prudent and reasonable to recognize that availability of qualified personnel for the physics department or slack fluctuate. And then he also worries later on after a long letter the third issue that he has to, wants to bring up in dealing with them is the concern of the university's obligation and opportunity to make use of the university's total scientific and educational potential. So you see, this is now 19, this is what he wrote in '63 in setting up the '65 issue, but that's what's that 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 is what's now uh, being fought, and uh, the problem was that there was a um, a joint uh, committee set up, and uh, it wasn't making any progress. The meetings just weren't getting where. There are memos about the meetings being inconclusive and uh, the things not being uh, uh, getting very far along. And Lyman is now the president. And so now it falls to Lyman. And Lyman had to interpret Sterling. And Lyman was really not ready. You know, the issue then came up for the first time that I know, now I can be corrected, of having an advisory committee. Visiting committee. Visiting committee. And that immediately drew attention that the gun was being put to the physics department's head and they couldn't deal with the issue under with a gun to their head. And I can read you a Meyer Hoff letter to that effect. <laughs> no, because I'd, 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 I'd like to hear your version and I can tell you what Bill Miller said. I said, yeah, well, Bill, Bill Miller was involved. Yeah. I, in fact, I think that uh, neither Miller nor uh, nor Hastor, following him, were willing to take on this issue and make and make a confrontation of it. Well, that was my impression. Anyway, all I can tell you is it concluded at a certain point because I'd had enough, and it's, I have to be personal here because it did influence things. I went in and I told Lyman early in '72 that I was going to leave. I'd been offered a very fancy job at MIT to replace Vicky Weisskopf as the, ch the head of the department. Right. Now, he wasn't a rotating chairman. He was head of the department. He ran the whole department. He was there, Felix. That's right. No, no, but he knew how to do it. He was yeah. a Viennese. <laughs> not a, not, he was a Swiss. Swiss. Not Swiss. That, that's Swiss. That's, no, no, but it was, it was run very well. I hope well. that got but, recorded. But, 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 you know, that, was a, that was a position that, for me at that age, uh, could have been attractive. Yes. And no. uh, I, uh, they, they wooed me and they wooed me. And uh, I eventually went to see Lyman, and I said, uh, I've, you know, it's been several months now. This has been going on. I have to let them know. If I go, I want you to know it'll be a defeat for me because I was here in the building of Slack. Slack is something I have very deep uh, loyalty to, Panofsky personally and to Slack. And I want to, I, I, uh, but, but if, you don't, uh, if you don't resolve this issue, so that we can make an appointment or two. That, so the word essentially equivalent didn't mean detailed balancing. Uh, I'm leaving. And uh, uh, the, the, uh, when, when, the, when the day of reckoning came, it, it's quite simple, and this is the record, so I'll say it. Bill Miller was sent up to talk to me at Slack, and he said, uh, Dick said no. I said, good, thank you, Bill, goodbye, I'm going. And he said, wait a minute, and he called up Dick. The answer came back okay. And I can tell you, I was, my reaction to that, that people would do something like that to see whether I was telling the truth. 
was not very sympathetic or favorable, mm -hmm. and I'll say no more. But that was what broke it. At that moment, we got free to make a few appointments to get out of balance, all understanding we had the same limit. And with that, my story ends. Well, I, I spoke to, to Ben Miller on the phone last week, and, and I mean, he didn't have any connection with the 80s, but he was provost in the 70s. That's right. right. And during this period. During this period. And he said Dick Lyman had gone for sabbatical for four, four months. Yeah. Even he was president. Uh, I don't know whether he went to England or what, but anyway, he was away. And Bill was, on Bill's desk yeah. was a memo, memorandum of understanding between physics and slack that had been hammered out in gory detail. Yep. And physics apparently had agreed, and then for some reason, just before he was about to sign it, Walter Meyerhoff, he said, came over and said, there's a revolt in the faculty, and, and Bob Hofstadter and, and yes. uh, yes. Bill Fairbank are threatening to resign, That's and right. physics said, I mean, Felix Bloch had already retired, but he said, I'm through with Stanford if this is signed. So Bill Miller Walter said, at least come over and meet with him. Now, Bill Miller's story yeah. is that basically he just listened to them and he got them, he sort of played them like a yeah. fine instrument and got them to tell him about their research. And, <laughs> and then yeah. eventually he signed it and they were like kittens and rolled yeah. over. Yeah. Now, whether that's really true or not, I, I don't, don't know. know. But it's a great story. Yeah. I mean, it shows the vanity of people like to talk about what they're doing. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, I have, I have a... Uh, a very good friend who's a historian. <laughs> he loves to say there's what actually happened and there are the myths, yes, and right. both are important. Yes, that's right. so, <laughs> so anyway, the, uh, anyway, it was signed. It was signed. That's and right. I've yeah. never seen that document. You no, may no. have a copy of it, but it doesn't matter. I, I couldn't find it. In my, I, you know, I, I don't keep the good records. The university must have a copy oh, yeah. somewhere, I'm sure. So anyway, it, <laughs> it, it, so w w once that was signed, uh, uh, you know, uh, it seemed to me th the war was over. And I mean, although the feelings were still frayed, and I'm really very sorry. It was over in the sense that this this yeah. precise coupling had, right. been right. had been and broken, and each unit could That's then right. do That's what right. it had to do. That's right, and the harassing of graduate students. I mean, there, there was a memo written by the graduate students in 1972, which I have, in which they wrote to the department saying the courses are inadequate, and uh, particularly in the high energy area, they pointed out all the strength that was out at the Slack that they couldn't have access to, uh, including the authors of the book that was the course for, it was 390 in, the, book, in advanced quantum. Bjorkane yeah, and that's right. And so that this, uh, that, but, but, you know, once that was broken and that somehow they had shot their wad, Felix had retired, and although they said they had resigned, uh, they didn't resign, uh, and I didn't have to go away. Uh, but it was a full decade before it was, before it really got right. dealt with in, a, Absolutely. in an open. Yeah. Uh, I mean, another I agree. another. And we'll come to that part. Another of the story, example, which, that's where Sandy and I uh, yeah. star. But I guess. An, another example, which must have been around seventy three, yeah. yeah. I was chair of graduate yeah. studies committee, yeah. and and Bill Fairbank had about twenty graduate students, but it yeah. wasn't just Bill's students. There was a whole movement by the graduate students to to form a union. Yeah, and and there were about seventy or eighty students yeah. who signed a petition, and then they brought the National yeah. Labor yeah. Relations Board in, oh. and 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 Stanford appointed a, a big deal lawyer from McCutcheon Doyle, and I have a good friend who was a lawyer in McCutcheon Doyle at that point, so he knew all about it, although yeah. he wasn't the lawyer yeah. who came, but the yeah. lawyer came yeah. and spent days with me, mm -hmm. and and the students made a crucial error because they only wanted to include students who were supported by contracts. And, and the way the lawyer yeah. played games with the NLRB was that I had to go through each of the 90 students or something, and I had no, I mean, yeah. I spent a lot of time learning about what they yeah. were doing, yeah. and I argued there's absolutely no difference between somebody who's supported on Fairbanks' contract and somebody who has an NSF grant. Yeah. Or a DOE yeah, yeah, grant, right. and so it's a ludic It doesn't make sense to have the thing set up that it's only students on contract, and the NLRB eventually agreed, and so the whole thing fell apart. Yeah. But it was basically on a technicality, yeah. and other universities now do have yeah. graduate yes. student yes. unions, and it was yes. there by the yeah. grace of God yeah. that we didn't have one. Yeah. It could have happened yeah. if they'd had a smart yeah. lawyer to help them draw up the yeah. case. Yeah. 
instead of spending arm and leg to get <laughs> McCutcheon Doyle to come down and do it. Yeah. No, you're, you're absolutely right, Mac. It was a decade. Yeah, well, Sandy and I, yeah. I mean, yeah. no. Yeah. But that was an example of the kinds of things yeah. that festered yeah. in the administration because yeah. it made Stanford well, look like the, foolish. Oh, yeah. There are letters in here from well, we'll Sterling. Come, we'll come to that. I'm going to yeah. stop you guys. No, there, that, that's... there are letters in here from Sterling during this period saying he's aware of what we look like to the outside world yeah. because people in the outside world were saying, what's going on at Stanford? This right. is crazy. Well, that's what I heard when I was in. But, but anyway, I would like to uh, turn the uh, discussion to the formation of the Applied Physics Department, Good. because that was, it's part of this story. Yes, yes. And it, it also, uh, because of the historical, uh, certainly during this time, connections between the Applied Physics Department and the microwave lab, it's, we, we've heard the story of big science, and now I think it, it, the, the, the two stories here are one, mm -hmm. the department, the other is how yeah. that all evolved in such a way that it did I wouldn't say proliferate, that sounds pejorative, but it did set a model yeah. for many of the independent yes. labs, which we'll come to yeah. towards the end. So, <clears throat> well, I think that the, the uh, impetus to form the Applied Physics Department, as I understand it, and I, I think I do, was sort of two. One was programmatic, that is to yeah. say, what areas of physics uh, does the physics department want to represent, yeah. and, and if there, and, and, uh, Marvin Chattero and, and others had the notion that uh, uh, there were uh, uh, solitate physics seemed to have a future yeah. and, and uh, optics and, and all of that. Yeah. And that was not something the physics department felt it wanted. I think Felix, who was, of course, the father of one of right. the fathers, right. certainly, of solitate physics, Absolutely. had made a judgment yeah. that that was not, uh, not uh, appropriate for the physics department. Uh, I think the other issue was that I think there were uh, in the physics department, correct me you two gentlemen if this isn't right, who were, you know, uh, in the orbit, if you like, of the microwave lab or what became, yeah. I guess we'll call it the microwave lab, yeah. and they had a different style. It was to reach out to the other departments. Yes. It was not to try to, yeah. to be the core, which is a valid thing to do. So there was a stylistic issue and there was a programmatic issue. So I think to solve those problems or to not block that, it was not contentious as I understand it, the formation of the Applied Physics no, Department and, and the resources on the margin no. that came because they were looking at SLAC, that was the high energy yeah. physics connection and these other things yeah. just were allowed to go over. Yeah. and. Uh, and I guess Terman and Bowker, who was the uh, dean, dean of graduate uh, stu uh, research at the time, were supportive of this. And it was formed as a division. Nobody, yes. even I think the yes. Marvin and others, felt, okay, let's not go completely to a department. Right. It might right. not work out. And yeah. let's see. Yeah. Okay. And then, what was it, uh, six years later, they formed yeah. the department. Yeah. That's my understanding. Yeah. So in any event, I think what, uh, what's interesting is the applied physics department then grew up uh, physically, really, in the microwave lab, yeah. which had then moved over yeah. to what we call yeah. the Ginston lab, called the Ginston lab yeah. later. And um, <clears throat> uh, so it was hand in glove with an independent lab. Yeah. And in fact, the applied physics department to this day does not own any yeah. laboratory yeah. space. All faculty members in applied yeah. physics are in independent labs. Well, and the grants are run through independent and labs. And the grants are run through But I was also labs. told that part of the issue was, was the issue of split salaries and that the setting up the division of applied physics allowed that issue to be addressed in the way that applied ah, physics you mean wanted. Playing, taking salaries physics, off of Physics had total doctrinal view mm -hmm. that nobody, everybody would teach the same amount. Mm -hmm. Nobody could, could use research money to buy Pay out of teaching. Yeah. And there would never be joint appointments. Yeah. And, that was and those were, those were two budget, huge so. things. And Both so, are gone now. Yeah, but, but I think, yeah. but I was told that they set up, one of the reasons for setting up the division of applied physics was that then they could split salaries and take yes. money. You could pay salaries off yes. research grants. And as that got right. harder and harder and harder, yeah. it evolved into yeah. the applied physics department being no different than the physics right. department. Right, but Everybody it, that took many, many years. Well, that, what and, Sandy and, said was exactly right. Yeah, but there was no yeah. negotiations. Yeah. Yeah. It just no, evolved. It was perfectly fine. So anyway, so I think that the, the, the thing that, that personally makes the applied physics department so fascinating to me is it had these two roles. One is it, it was starting to, to express certain yes. subfields of physics yes. 
and it is it always was involved in these independent labs. Yeah. And this, I think, played. I mean, when you think of the the members in the applied physics department who have led or helped create these things, it's rather remarkable. I don't think it's because we're any smarter. I think it's because we had those experiences and we knew how to yeah. do it. Excellent system. And uh, well, so they I think they played a huge role in the no, university had administration. Been, yeah, had we had over our the own years. space, or had we had to teach undergraduates, we probably couldn't have played that role. Yeah. And that's just the history. But coming back to the programmatic side of it, I think um, uh, when the microwave lab w was formed, uh, uh, w when it moved over in applied physics, uh, moved over physically, and applied physics became involved. There were a couple of things happened. The microwave lab, of course, evolved through the, the maser to lasers yes. to quantum electronics, yeah. as we now know yeah. it. That was a natural progression yeah. because the science opportunities were there. So it grew out of going back to the 1940s, the story you told about the, the Klystron, right, okay? Right. And so that was a natural intellectual progression. Uh, and um, <clears throat> the other was they, Marvin, gets the credit for recognizing that what was then known as solid state physics, now known as condensed matter physics, yes. becoming materials physics, that seemed to him an area in which um, there was uh, great potential and that, given how important it is now, that was a very insightful thing in his part. And that's when uh, Ted Jabal, Walt Harrison, Seb Doniak, uh, Artie Bienenstock, yeah. and then at the end of that era, I came and joined, and that was the original yeah. group. Um, uh, and I think also uh, in 1962, which was when the department became a division, Marvin, who was then Marvin Chowder, who was then in the physics department, uh, was supposed to go out and find two people to come in and create not high energy yeah. positions. And he came up with Art Shallow and Cal Quaid, and he only had one position. So he just said, well, we want both of them. Smart man. So Art ended up in the physics department, and, Mar and uh, Quaid came to, to applied physics. I don't think it could have been the other way around, but it wasn't. And there were consequences of that, yeah. of course, in that atomic physics grew up and then evolved in physics, uh, at the, the pure part of it, with Art. And, and then Cal Quaid came over, and I think I would say... Uh, uh, is the symbol in my mind of going back to the Hansen uh, yeah. uh, era of what the applied physics <coughs> department likes to call the inventor physicist, yeah. somebody who makes new tools. Yeah. But that's a very misunderstood aspect of applied physics in, in, my, in my experience because people think that, and I think maybe to some degree the School of Engineering thinks or thought that that's what they should do. They should serve the engineering physics side of, say, electrical engineering. Whereas, in fact, the perception in the applied physics is, no, no, that's not what we do. We invent tools that change science, that create whole new opportunities. And that tradition goes right back to... That, that was exactly the problem, in yeah. getting some people to realize why the people who build Slack had to be real scientists. Not yes. Just well, and, and I think, I think that, that, that there, exactly are, there right. are applied physics departments yes. that go one way and go another, yeah. but that's what happened here. And I just wanted to make the yeah, connection that's, back that's to... That's absolutely right. So anyway, so that, and needless to say, has been extremely successful. And uh, the applied physics department still doesn't have any space, but it doesn't care. <laughs> and so, uh, uh, but I, I did want to, uh, no. of course, mention that, uh, I mean, uh, through the microwave tradition, and I think Tony Siegman and, and, and Marvin, then uh, that's when, you know, yeah. um, oh gosh... Steve Harris and Bob Beyer yeah. came and, yeah. and so on and so forth. And so that tradition was... Bob Beyer was in one of my first or second class mm -hmm. that I taught at Stanford. He was brilliant. <laughs> he was good then and he certainly has proved well, himself. Well, and then he's, you know, he's not <coughs> doing gravity wave detection, right? So that's all in this tradition. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, so anyway, I uh, would like to suggest, unless our management disagrees, that we stop here. That's a good break point. Because... This was the situation in late That's right. yeah. 1970, yeah. say 72. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a real and, break point for the slack story. It's a break point for the slack yeah. story. Applied physics was in place yeah. and thriving. Yeah. And now 
I think in the next session yeah, we yeah, have, yeah. we can address yeah. the rapprochement yeah. and, and how the intellectual yeah, agenda yeah, yeah. has changed and how many, I haven't counted them up, but I'm sure there's three or four independent labs that came yeah. directly out of this yeah. and that will be. Anyway, Great. so no, I suggest yeah. that we gather I, I again want, tomorrow. I have one comment that can be put in or not put in, but you said I was deputy director until 1968 in the opening. 19, no. You said what you said. Well, what I said and what I should have said may not be the same thing. What was the date? Uh, I, I became deputy director in 1969. Until, until when? I, until I became emeritus. <laughs> okay. Well, gentlemen, welcome back <clears throat> in our second day of this oral history. Um, for the sake of the viewers, let me just recapitulate uh, a little bit what we talked about yesterday to lead into our discussions today. Uh, Sid gave us a wonderful uh, history of the Klystron era and how that led to the formation of the microwave lab, which was had faculty from physics and electrical engineering and was the first independent lab as we know it today at, at Stanford, operating under the Dean of Research. That was a relatively uncontentious um, change in the university's operations. Then we heard about the creation of SLAC, which was uh, uh, not so uncontentious, or was contentious. <laughs> and uh, um, uh, we heard a lot about the uh, bitter disputes with the physics department in trying to f adjust to the presence of SLAC and really big science at Stanford. And uh, as Sid told us, it wasn't until the early 70s when there was enough uh, loosening up of those uh, issues uh, to permit SLAC to evolve in the way it needed to to, to fill its mission and, and do the science that it wanted to do. But of course, uh, as a little bit we'll hear today, there was still a lot of ill will, um, and uh, but that subsided over the next decade, and, and there was uh, uh, a lot of... Uh, there was a transition to the way physics is today where I think those issues are largely resolved. Um, however, uh, on, on the other hand, if we trace the evolution of what happened in the, in the formation of independent labs with the microwave lab being non-contentious, some of the formation of some of the more recent ones did have its contentious aspects, so in some sense the balance shifted. But that's part of the story that I think uh, our management wants us to tell. So let's get on with it. Uh, so, um, so after this period, Sandy, when, when Slack was sort of cut loose to, to do its thing, uh, there, were still, there was still a sense of problems. And I would say, having, being at that point in my life, outside of Stanford, really people were saying a sense of decline. Do you want to kind of pick, paint a picture well, of what I was would, going on? I'm not sure I'd say a sense of decline. I would say a sense of disarray. Okay. That uh, I mentioned last time, and I think it was 73, when something like 90 students tried to form a union, 90 physics graduate students tried to form a graduate student union, and the university spent a lot of time and energy and money hiring big-time lawyers to come in and prep me, who was chair of the graduate study committee, to testify in front of the National Labor Relations Board. They sent, we had a, I think it was a two-day hearing, and I was basically on the stage a lot of the time, and mm -hmm. I had to talk about each of the, essentially each of the students, and I had to be familiar enough to say what they were doing, and, and the fact that this was, this just looked bad. It made the university feel physics didn't have its act together. Uh, I actually went back and checked the chairs. Walter Meyerhoff was chair of the physics department from 70 to 77. Dirk Walechka from 77 to 82, Stan Wojcicki from 82 to 85, and then I was chair from 85 to 90. And I would say under Walter Meyerhoff, there was a major change in the way the physics department operated. I said again yesterday that it was, when I came, it was kind of like Victorian England, where each person knew his role in the hierarchy, <laughs> and you never tried to step outside of it. But uh, there was a decision slowly made that you had to get rid of this unanimous vote. And so 
For appointments. For appointments, and I don't remember. I it was don't... only in the physics department, not slightly right. else. No, the physics mm -hmm. department had a very, I mean, <clears throat> I'm sure it was Felix Bloch's legacy, but they had some very peculiar policies, and I actually asked Artie Bienenstock, was there any university concern the way physics operated? Because if an assistant professor was appointed for three years, and you had to be either promoted or leave, and... Uh, and then all appointment matters had to be unanimous, and those were both very restrictive. So it was either under Walter or Dirk, and I don't remember which, that they changed to a much more normal seven-year uh, period for an assistant professor. Ah, um, yeah. a, you were appointed for three or four years, and then you were reappointed for another three or four years to be a total of seven, and then you would either be promoted or you had to leave. Yeah, and, which uh, is like... Certainly applied physics. That, that's yeah. much more standard. And, right. and we also got rid of this unanimous votes. Uh, I mean, sometimes people used it to settle scores against other people in the department. And again, the dean's office certainly would hear about this. And uh, I mean, the story I remember is, and uh, it was probably Hastorf, the physics department wanted to make some appointment in high energy physics, I believe. I don't know who. And the Hastorf picked up the phone and called somebody at Slack, and the person at Slack said, I can't imagine why they'd want to make an appointment like that. <laughs> and so Hastorf felt that, again, the lack of communication... He was provost at the time? He was provost. I, th I think it was Hastorf. Yeah. But, I mean, that's, that was the thing that sort of led to the whole knocking heads together to move forward. But that was, that was in the mid-'80s or the early-'80s. In the 70s, Leonard Schiff, when he was chair... And until he died in spring of 71, I, he was on, Marsh O'Neill said he was always sort of the glue that held the Heppel Administrative Committee together. And, and he kept everybody under control. And when he died, the Heppel people started getting very fractious against each other. I don't know the issue between... He did this by the force of his personality and skill? Well, or he was just, skillful and I yeah, think he yeah. would, I mean, he was chair for, from 48 to 66. Yeah. And so he, he basically ran the department. I mean, Felix Block was behind oh, shoot. behind the scenes like a like my fair lady <laughs> pulling the strings. But Leonard Schiff was the one who, who signed all the letters and dealt with everything. I mean you, you had all those letters from Wally Sterling to to Leonard yesterday. But um, Marsh O'Neill, who was the administrative director or administrative assistant, associate or whatever he was called. He was the, the person who made it run, the microwave lab and then Heppel. He was the administrative head. Right. But he said that Hofstetter and Fairbank were at each other a lot. And I suspect, I mean, Fairbank had the idea, and it was actually very successful, to take over the old linear accelerator and give it superconducting cavities, right. niobium cavities. And this was the first superconducting accelerator, and Fairbank basically wanted to keep it as a tool to study superconducting accelerators, and I presume Hofstadter wanted to do physics on it, and that was a tension. And then this sort of was delegated to subsequently, there was a huge blow up between Alan Schwetman and Stan Hanna over the same issue, because Schwetman, I mean, again, the appointment of physics had a, a somewhat of a history of cronyism, because they appointed a couple of assistant professors to tenure who were basically appointed because they, the senior faculty said, I absolutely can't live without having this person to help me. And that's a very bad reason for making appointments. And I don't think I need to go into the names, but no. it's pretty clear. Well, that's what I was getting at before. I mean, I think from the outside, that practice, I mean, people knew about the problems between Slack and the physics yeah. department. And they, they understood that that well, I don't know if it's inevitable, but that's a little bit the character of things. But I think there really were some... Kind well, this some, feuding... They, to me, they were saying, look, be careful when you go out there, because I, in the last decade, the physics department has not made the strongest appointments. The you're, feuding you're between Schwetman and Hanna only led to funding agencies just saying to hell with it and cut yeah. off funding yeah. for the linear accelerator. And that was several million dollars mm. a year, and that certainly got the administration's attention. Mm -hmm. So I think that was probably in the late 70s, early 80s. During this period, let me say, as I saw it, the physics department was almost unique among 
major university physics departments in not having a visiting committee because an outside visiting committee often could be adjudicator or give advice or prevent things like this getting to that breaking point and going to the president's office and the physics department was dead set against that. Well, there was a visiting committee in the in the about eighty three or eighty four. Yeah, but I'm talking about the, in, in the I'm 70s. talking about during the seventies. Finally, <clears throat> finally, over a great opposition, it was accepted in the eighties. That was my point. And, but there's and, a little bit more to that history. Go ahead. Well, I don't know. I mean, I I think it was either just before I became chair, or when I was chair in eighty five, that there was a visiting committee. That's right. Yes, and that I that remember. was the time that. They particularly, I remember, and I mentioned it yesterday, they talked about the importance of, of enabling all the assistant professors to participate fully in departmental affairs mm -hmm. and, and let them, I mean, they, they basically since then they've served on all appointment committees. Right which was, uh, would have been unheard of under block and shift. As I recall that era, there was a visiting committee in physics and the visiting committee in applied physics which then did their individual examinations and then yeah. came together at the end. Well, there was another one in 2000. Okay. Were, I think that was 2000. Okay. But the main, the, there were several major issues, <clears throat> and one of them was the fact that there was a major number of retirements, upcoming yeah. retirements. Yeah. And so the, the physics department was charged with coming up with long range plan and that took most of a year mm -hmm. but it was if people finally s signed off on it bob laughlin god bless him was part of he was on the committee and when it came to the faculty for their consideration he he said look you have to recognize this is a zero sum game and if you want to do more of one thing you've got to do less of something else and they wouldn't let us make any new appointments until we had sorted out the that, long term planning. Okay. And we bit the bullet. There was a strong desire among a lot of the faculty to move into astrophysics and cosmology. And uh, yeah, we'll come back to that and too. And so, yeah. uh, <clears throat> in order to do that, we made what I still think is the right choice. It was a painful choice basically to stop doing nuclear physics. And Stan Hanna was outraged about that, and Walter Meyerhoff had already moved into atomic physics, and it was very difficult for Dirk Wolitschko. And Dirk, Dirk went to Dirk, Jefferson. I think that was one of the reasons why Dirk decided to accept the offer to go to the, what's now the Jefferson lab. It used to be CBAF. He was the scientific director, so his job was to set up a series of, put out re requests for proposals for right, experiments. For of, yeah. and, uh, and he was highly successful at that. And I think it was, he was very happy doing that, so it's, it turned out to be a good choice. But then, having done that, we were then able to start making some really nice appointments, I would say, and things went better. Can you say a little bit about, I mean, Stan Han, uh, not Stan Han, Stan Wojcicki was saying uh, there were some stressful interactions with the administration during this time, too. Well, Stan, I mean, I had thought there'd been a meeting with all the people from Slack and physics, but Stan Wojcicki said there was just, he said soon after he became chair, which is probably 82 or 83, there was basically a letter from the provost uh, with no, <laughs> with from Lee Stan's view, no consultation, saying that I'm going to form a visiting committee to deal yeah, with the right, issues yeah. between Slack and physics. Right. And, and Stan said, he actually went to Raw, went to uh, Hasdorf and said, why are you doing this? Because I've never heard about it until I became chair and suddenly you send this letter. And he said, well, I decided it wasn't worth asking people because I'd already made up my mind. Now, to my knowledge, this visiting committee never took place. Yeah, but that, that, that was my earlier remark. During the 70s, from, and even back to, even beginning with Sterling, the idea that a visiting committee to review the, the very fractious relation between physics and um, slack, and but by the way, and also inc include what was happening in applied physics. Mm -hmm. Not that there was any issue there. Yeah, but just so we, include it as included, part of the so physics community. Right. And, and the physics department, in the, in the documents I read, said over our dead body on that. And there was mm -hmm. well, like that. that was before Wojcicki. And so getting it up to the point, I mean, Hofstadter was, Hasdorf was inheriting 
a long yeah. series of battles. <laughs> That's what... Anyway, Stan said that Jim Ross, who subsequently became provost, was the associate dean that Stan worked with. And Stan quotes Jim Ross as saying that, I don't think we need a visiting committee. We know what we need to do. We just have to sit down and do it. And, and, and I think that's when you and I became chair. Right. And, and <laughs> we did it. <laughs> but I mean, another example of disarray is the physics department had a machine shop, which was always running in the red. And uh, one of my first beat up, being beaten up by Norm, Norm Wessels, who was Dean of Humanities and Sciences, he called me in and said, I've just been seen the numbers and this is un intolerable. What are you going to do about it? It turned out the numbers were wrong, but that didn't matter. I mean, so it was another example that physics department looked as if it just didn't know how to run its own ship. Mm -hmm. and, and that led to my memory of you and me setting up, first of all, discussions between physics and applied physics, right. just to start I mean, it wasn't that physics and applied physics fought with each other. It's just they were, it was benign neglect, I would say. There was no well, that was sense certainly, of interaction. Yeah, was certainly the applied physics, looking over at the, the situation we discussed yesterday and you're alluding to, I mean, it did, it, we did feel like it was a benign neglect and we were just happy with that. But I mean, it was, it certainly in the long term has been better. Well, we were growing the, and... You, know, you knew how to handle yourself, too. <laughs> the interactions certainly improved and then subsequently, probably after about a year, we started you and me and... Yeah, let's hold back on okay. that a minute because I, as I recall that era when you and I said, look, we just, as I said, we were starting on a basis of friendship and collegiality. Yeah. It was more an issue in my mind of sorting out where do we want to go, we meaning the physics community, where do we want to go in terms of new, you know, the, 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 the important and, 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 and lively areas of physics <clears throat> in uh, looking ahead, and you had you were sorting out this nuclear physics issue, and in applied physics, it was really uh, more a question of what not so much the balance, but how to how to let the uh, uh, laser and quantum electronics community, which was very healthy and had been sort of the core of the Ginston lab, and the and the materials or condensed matter physics part both be successful, uh, and as uh, as both you two know. Uh, there was this little, I don't know what word to use, maybe a segment of the applied physics department, which sort of got formed under Peter Sturrock, uh, which was some combination of astronomy and, and solar physics and plasma physics and, and by Petrosian, more, I would say, more standard astrophysics. It was kind of a mixed bag. You know, I'm, I'm not saying that was good or bad, but, but it was odd in the applied physics department. So part of the negotiations that uh, um, were not so smooth was, at least from my position in applied physics, was moving that group over I mean, it seemed to, to the leadership of the applied physics department that they belonged, that, that intellectually that field belonged in physics and that we had to work out that transition and we had to make sure that, you know, that, because we knew, you and I knew, and Sid I'm sure would have agreed, that astrophysics had to come to Stanford. It's just too important and we had no way to do it. So by moving it to physics, I think that was the right thing to do and eventually happened. But of course, uh, those that group was not entirely happy because they felt pushed around, which well, I can understand at the human level. And then in something like 1986 or 87, there was a separate visiting committee to talk about how Stanford could move, on, move into astrophysics. Right. And, and I think Chris McKee from yes. Berkeley was probably chair of it. Yes. But there was a very high-powered group, and they were there for a couple of days, and they certainly spoke loud and clear. I mean, I mean not, you would expect they would because they were astrophysics people, basically. Well, but Chris they were, is actually they, solar physics, but, but, but there they, was that they, cla they, ca they certainly strongly supported the idea that right. Stanford should have a presence in this. Yes. And it really wasn't until CHIPAC was Well, formed. that's the ultimate expression of it. But, but, but the fact <laughs> that the university was clearly supportive of this was very important, I think, in getting to CHIPAC. Yeah, well, I think that, that from... Uh, as I understood uh, their feelings, and, and I think they were not, I mean, they were easy to understand, is that they had created this 
I mean, they felt a little defensive, right? Because here they were in applied physics, and high energy physics was was you know where the the tension of the physics and the slack were, so they felt kind of isolated. They didn't feel like they had the right home, but they they weren't sure that they would be welcome in the physics department either, and so there was some sensitivities that they were really being pushed in that direction, and uh, I think that uh, there was also, of course, uh, I think a. Uh, uh, I've learned over my year, over the years, that there's a difference between astronomy, if you think of it as an observational science, and astrophysics, which is something that yeah. we three have a more natural understanding of. And that tension was there as well, because I think it was the view, uh, in, in I think the physics community broadly, that it was astrophysics, not mm -hmm. astronomy, because you have Berkeley, which is, of course, a powerhouse in astronomy, and so on and so forth. So, so those issues were playing out. But and we never had access to a telescope. Never had access was, to a telescope. That was the big issue, and it was so expensive. Yeah. Right. And Berkeley had good access through right. the university system. And in now, it's, of course, yeah. telescopes per se play a less of a role, and there's other other yeah. space and so on and so forth. So in any event, I just, I mean, that was, uh, I think, the only uh, contentious issue uh, in that re resolution of the relationship mm -hmm. between applied physics and, yeah. and physics. Uh, yeah. And I think later the interest of, of slack in astrophysics came, but that's more the Kaipak story. That's right. But, uh, but I, I have to say that, uh, you know, I wouldn't say that I was always as, as diplomatic as I perhaps should have been during that. Uh, and I know uh, uh, Art Walker was not very happy with me. Uh, but I think after the move was over and it was all over in physics, I think they felt that that really was the right thing to do. Certainly Peter Sturick did. He told me that later and so on and so forth. So I think, you know, once the... The, the personal issues were sort of resolved, and uh, and I think uh, you know, Kaipak is the natural uh, natural uh, expression of yeah. all of that. Of course, it took Roger Blandford to come and so on and so forth. But that. But he wouldn't have come happened. if there hadn't been no, strong commitments come. on the part of yeah. the administration. And in fact, uh, uh, there was a lot of the Hewlett gift money that went into mm -hmm. Kaipak, which was a nice thing too. So. And to drive home the point. He as director and Steve Kahn as deputy director right. came as joint appointments yes. in physics and slack, right. which shows you how far right. the issues have been resolved. Well, it was, there was also this interesting, I mean, you and I originally didn't remember it quite the same way, so I'll tell my version, but there had never been joint appointments between applied physics and, new, new joint appointments between yeah. applied physics and physics, physics and applied yeah. physics. And we were recruiting Steve Chu for the the physics department was yeah. recruiting. And Sandy and I were, of course, very coordinating, yeah. highly coordinated in what we were doing. And I remember the week before he came, yeah. the way I remember it, Sandy, is we were talking about what questions he might ask and what we would need to do, and we decided that he may ask for a joint appointment in applied physics. That would have been the first. I think the first joint, this was before Roger, so the first joint appointment physics with anybody. Yeah, this would have been 85 or 86. Yes, exactly. And and you and I decided that we'd better deal with it before he came. So that if the issue came up, we could say, no problem. Yeah. And you went to your faculty and I went to mine. I don't know that we had faculty meetings, so we didn't have a whole lot of time. And both said, yes, that would be a good thing. And that was the, the, real, path the, the, the real path breaker and symbolic uh, yeah. And uh, so uh, I, I think that was uh, one of your and my finer hours. <laughs> but but uh, so that, and he did ask the question, and he was made. Yeah, and it and, was, it was, I think it was the first joint appointment. Yes. That's and then a lot of people. And it was, I think, before there were real joint appointments with Slack. Oh, yeah. It really was the first joint appointment that the yeah, physics Yeah, physics had never, had, had always refused to have joint right. appointments. Right. And then there were, Seb Doniak got a part-time appointment in physics, and I got a part-time appointment in applied physics, and Bob Laughlin for a while had a joint appointment with physics and applied physics, and I don't remember the details, but there were a whole bunch of them. Yeah, well, to show you that, that you can't please all of the people all of the time, the dean of engineering was not happy about these developments, but we'll come to that uh, later. Um, so anyway, well then, Sandy, I, as I remember it, I don't remember where it happened, but certainly you, Bert, and I got the notion that we should sit down and start. Well, I think we'd basically been told 
by the provost and the dean of H and S and probably the president even to, you've got to get your act together. I mean, the statement mm -hmm. I was told, although I wasn't at any, I don't think there was a meeting, and I never saw this Astorf letter. But what what I was told is that. <coughs> The feuding and the lack of coordination is hurting the corporate whole of physics with a small p, yeah. and it's crucial that we get our act together. Right. And you and I started, first of all, bringing together physics and applied right. physics, and then the three of us, then Bert Richter and you and I met probably twice a quarter to talk about this, and we sort of slowly worked things out. In fact, I, I don't know whether, I must have told you this, but Early on in that, David Leith was part of it, and you said yeah. Bill Spicer was right. part of it, and David Leith invited me to have lunch at, at Quadras across from yeah. Slack. Yeah. And he basically, he was used to getting his way. <laughs> uh, he's a, <laughs> dare I say, and he sort of expected that he could lean on me and that, that we would do what he thought was right, and we didn't. No, we I didn't. I mean, there were lots of issues, but... I mean, one of them that I mentioned, and I guess this is an appropriate time to talk about it, was the issue of slack teaching. Right. Do you want me to do that, talk about that now? Well, uh, just, just let me say later? one thing first. I mean, the, the, we should talk about that, and, and I have my, uh, there were some issues with applied physics as well, but, but basically I, I, I think my memory of it, and we'd come a long way already, was that those meetings with the five of us, uh, Bert, you and I, and, and David Leith and, and Bill Spicer, in some sense representing SSRL and also the physics that was in Double E. You know, you, 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 we started with the simple issues. That's really not a problem. You know, if, uh, do we have to have cosigners in physics? Well, not really. And so all these things that were a little silly, yeah or maybe not silly in their day, but had become silly or irrelevant, were slowly worked away. And then it's, we, it's, it's, it's a classic thing of working up, well, you're, you, you studied I mean, negotiations. I mean, you get to the hard things at the end, I and mean, that's but, the way it went. But that was partly the fact that the people who was, would have said over my dead body had retired. Exactly. And yeah. so it was a matter of right. outliving them. Or, and, and just getting them on the table and saying, okay, this is how we're going to do it going forward, or that's gone. I mean, the idea of joint searches... Right. Was a big deal, and right. that's, that's been highly successful. Right. I mean, and so come back to the teaching. Well, and then there was, I mean, Slack had all, my understanding is that P insisted that the university pay 5% of every faculty member's right. salary. Yeah. Under the, the logic was that if you're a faculty member, you're going to be asked to do some administrative things, serve on university committees, serve on oral exams as chairs or other things, as readers. And, and he didn't want to have to nickel and dime with the DOE. So basically he said, we'll just charge 5% of everybody's salary to the university. <laughs> that and that was an umbrella that would then cover whatever small amount of service yeah, they did. Yeah. And then, but there were people who wanted to teach. And right. the issue was how should they be compensated, compensated for it? And David Leith took the view, well, it's obvious it should be 50% of their salary when they're teaching. And, and I said, I think that's way too much because a faculty member has teaching, they have research, yeah. they have advising, they have Well, this notion of 25% when you're teaching was long established in, in our departments long before this. Well, anyway, that was, that was yeah. the formula that I put forward and Bert, God bless him, said, I think that sounds reasonable and that shut David Leith up. <laughs> yeah. But David Leith was prepared to make a big stink about it. And, you know, as I say, he was used to getting his way. <laughs> so that was funny. Yeah. And then uh, this is a little bit out of, out of jumping ahead, but when I was director of Heppel for a year in 1995, 96, yeah. uh, they were trying to figure out how to deal with GLAST, which is this big project. Yes, right. It was joint between Heppel, which was mostly financed by NASA, and Slack, which was the DOE funding. And apparently there'd never been a big joint project between NASA and DOE. They have very different cultures and very different ways of dealing yes. with bookkeeping. And, <laughs> and so, I mean, and Peter Michelson basically was the driving force behind all this because he, I mean, again, yes. the wisdom, the class. Co coming yeah. back to the wisdom of the dean's office, uh, when Hofstadter had retired, he wanted to be recalled to active duty. And he'd done, that, he'd done that for five years, and he wanted another five years. And Brad Efren, 
was the, I think it's when I was chair of physics and Brad Efron was the, the associate, associate dean, dean and he said, well, we're willing to do this, but you've got to designate some faculty member who could step in and take over if Bob Hofstetter were incapacitated, who would take over the projects. Right. And so Peter Michelson was sort of at loose ends because he'd been dealing with this huge two-ton oh, aluminum the earthquake. bar. Oh, uh, yes. Uh, the which gravity was supposed wave to be a gravity wave right. detector. Right. And that was clearly not going to keep getting funding. And so he went over. Well, that and, also was damaged by Loma Prieta. I guess. Yeah, I guess that's what happened. Yeah. Anyway, Bob Hofstetter agreed that Peter Michelson would, would become involved with this earlier version, Egret. And so Bob, Peter Michelson had been actively involved in dealing with uh, these astrophysics gamma ray experiments. And then with the SLAC technology, people realized you could do something much better. And, and, and then there was a very contentious meeting that Gerhard Kasper called when I was director of Heppel. Charles Kruger was there as the person I reported to, and Bert Richter was there as since he reported to the president, Gerhard Kasper. Right. And uh, <laughs> Bert kept saying, I don't understand why we're having this meeting. Why are we having this meeting? And finally, Gerhard Kasper laid his cards on the table and he said, well, I want to make sure that this whole issue of glass is dealt with equitably. And Bert basically took the view, well, since Slack has all the expertise at running big programs, they should be the PIs and they should run it. And Gerhard Kasper finally said, I don't think that's the right way to do it. I, my understanding is that Peter Michelson has been the intellectual force behind all this. And so my, my judgment is that Peter should be the PI, which was not what Bert expected. No. And, and I think that was the genesis. And because it was Slack was so actively involved, Peter then became a joint, at least some kind of auxiliary joint appointment at, at SLAC in physics, it okay. and that was the first, <laughs> I think that was the beginning of the it's joint appointments between yeah. physics and SLAC. Yeah. Yes. But, I mean, this, this was very, we were all, the four of us were in Gerhard's office, Casper's office, yeah. and it was, uh, I mean, I don't know whether people heard much about this meeting, but it was I heard pretty fascinating. It. <laughs> well, as long as we're talking about Bert, I do remember <clears throat> in the discussions of this committee between SLAC and the on-campus uh, departments, uh, this was a serious discussion. I mean, Bert's uh, model was the MIT model, yeah. where there was a big department and all the various facets that our smaller right. departments represented. And I don't remember where you were, Sandy, but I certainly spoke up for not doing that. And uh, I think my reasoning was that, you know, if you're as big as MIT, well, maybe it would work. But, but here, we, we really weren't in total that big. And so by having these units, yeah. which we would, we would be, in my view, we would be better off having these units which were communicating yeah. and doing something corporately that was yeah. rational, yeah. but where in making appointments you didn't get into, you know, what is physics and what, I mean, it, yeah. it made smaller units which could make those decisions a little more yeah. easily uh, and creatively, I mean, I, I and, 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 and I, that whether that prevailed by the logic or just because it, nobody wanted to make the change, and I don't know. To do know. the MIT system, you needed two things. First of all, you needed one person who was the czar of all physics, right. not department heads. I mean, that was Weisskopf. He was yeah. the czar. Then they were heads of the, the subunits. Yeah. And secondly, it was the, just the magnitude, the size of the right. department, the number of billets. Right. That made it. But I mean, it worked. I mean, it's work. obviously it very quite, strong. It worked very well. I mean, yeah. Berkeley, but I don't think it would have worked here. Berkeley, I still don't. <laughs> Berkeley occasionally had problems, in the, at least among the theory people, when they wanted to make an appointment because you get all the people in different areas yeah. and sit around a table and figure out which area they were going to make an appointment in. Yeah. And, and it was very, it didn't always lead to happy outcomes. Right. And so I think it's much better that SLAC would make its appointments and physics yeah. would make its appointments and applied physics makes its appointments without having other people have a veto or at right, least a right. oversight over it. And I think if that's worked very well, I think we've kept, uh, the, the, we've allowed communities yeah, to grow and be strong. And there's joint right, exactly. I mean, one of the biggest outcomes of these, these rapprochements between physics, applied physics, and SLAC was the idea that just you'd keep everybody informed of what your appointment plans right. are. That's right. And, right. and so if you've already talked about it, then you can't say And, and it does crazy. have a quality control issue. I mean, if something was a little weak, you'd hear about it, mm -hmm. which, is, which is the way you want it to be. But I have to tell one more story about Bert. I, I like this one. When we were talking about the teaching, 
of course, you know, there were some tensions there, maybe the residuals of some of the things yeah. that you alluded to and whatever. And Bert had, classic Bert Richter, had this brilliant notion of, okay, this is what we're going to do, guys. We're going to go to the provost and we're going to get some money to pay for this teaching. Of course, the fact that everybody could get money from the provost and this wasn't going to come out of anybody's teaching budgets and help slack. Yeah. Well, it was brilliant. It was classic Bert. And it, and it worked. That's worked. what happened. We did get. I mean, we it's did. now insufficient, but it was helpful for well, a long I think, time. Well, I think with, uh, we'll come to the, the, the new directions of slack at the end, but uh, I think if it, it, it's, I think, very likely to have another go-round, not yeah. with any contention, but just, okay, if you, if you leaders of the university, if you want all this teaching done, you know, pay for it. And, well, and, I may and maybe say, there'll be another uh, infusion of funds into that little kitty. That, and that I, worked very well. When I was chair, there were occasional cases of somebody from Slack who promised they would teach. And then in Back out. Come, come September, Back they out. would say, my <laughs> research is so yeah, important to me, I, I'm yeah. not going to be able to teach. And so you had to scramble to find somebody. Well, that's not so good. We didn't have that. So, but that, that made yeah. you a little cynical yeah. Yeah. about yeah. Yeah. the desire to teach. Also, in the teaching business, it began to be that the physics department was more and more urging slack people to teach their, to help with the, the teaching loads and meet, right. so they could have more courses. So well, that, it's instead of, in the beginning, you could not allowed to teach, you're not allowed to even teach not for credit. The, the thing developed to the point was right. we were being asked we could use a few more bodies. Yeah, well, there was the, the, the part of the, I mean, there were a number of, of people from Slack who taught in, uh, yeah, in, in, yeah. in applied physics. I mean, John Fox yeah. created this wonderful electronics course, well, which is legendary. Say something about how the, in applied physics, the accelerator part of Slack got very deeply incorporated. Yeah, let, let, let me, That's I was gonna, just going to come to that, yeah. That's a creative thing. Well, what happened was, th there's two aspects of it. Um, just to, to, I'll segue from the teaching. Yeah. There, there was uh, uh, the uh, accelerator, accelerator yeah. physics yeah. courses yeah. actually were taught yeah. under applied physics banner with using these monies. But, <clears throat> of course, during this period that we were talking about, uh, uh, Seb Doniak and Bill Spicer got the notion of creation of what we now call SSRL, using synchrotron right. radiation for other areas of science, and that's obviously been enormously successful. Well, the, the uh, uh, slack, I don't know what terms you exactly use, but you had your accelerator physicists, which were part of yes. slack, yeah. and SSRL had uh, uh, like people That's or right. similar people, yeah. and, all, and, and uh, this was a distinguished bunch, so yes. there wasn't any, oh, yes. any problem there. And, and uh, they, the ones that were worrying about synchrotron radiation yeah. issues uh, made their departmental connections in applied physics, Herman Winnick being perhaps yeah. the most, uh, most prominent one. Uh, and with all of this going on, uh, David Leith, I think, in our discussions then raised the question, well, why, why doesn't applied physics take responsibility for accelerator physics? I think he was trying to, you know, do more with his budgets or something like that. That's typical. And, and I remember, I mean, I, I was slightly annoyed to tell you the truth because I said, look, you know, we can be good colleagues yes. and whatnot, yeah. but, you know, we do have our own agenda. Yeah. <laughs> but I was perhaps a little more, less diplomatic no about comment. it. No comment. So anyway, but that, that was sort of comic relief on, on, on top of all yeah. this. So, but anyway, I think uh, um, after Peter, who were the next uh, joint appointments between Slack and uh, physics? Do you remember <clears throat> I would guess it was partly connected with the Kavli. Okay. I think before, <coughs> wasn't it before Kavli, the, the, theory, uh, the, the theory group ones? There may have been. With the Eva and... Uh, yeah. that was, that's the one I was thinking of, but I can't yeah. remember the order. Because Eva had an Silverstein appointment at Slack, and, and, then, and then Berkeley wanted her to come to Berkeley, yeah. and we wanted Shamit to come from Berkeley to Stanford, and they decided to come to Stanford. And the, yeah. the, the, the way it works was it, they had one billet in physics and one billet yeah. in Slack. And they, did, and they each yeah. split half and yeah. half, yeah. so yeah. they only would, taught yeah. half but time. So we were cutting deals then in a yeah, reasonably right. friendly way. But it was way. almost yeah. about the same time, as I recall. Yeah. And then that, uh, I mean, that has a very interesting... Yeah. Then they went off to Santa segue, Barbara and came they back. They went to Santa that's Barbara <laughs> for a year, yeah. and they were offered... Everybody assumed they would stay at Santa yeah. Barbara, yeah. but they eventually decided to come back. They said they would, and they changed their minds. So it was very interesting. But the... 
Uh, it was about the same time as that, wasn't it, that Roger and Steve Kahn came, came as on a joint Well, there was this piece and Chin had a brother. Who gave money. Who gave money, but it turned out that he was going to give it over five annual installments in the interval. His company tanked and the money disappeared. So he didn't have Not them, all of it. But Not he didn't it. have nearly as much money. That's right. And then Steve Chu <laughs> somehow knew about Kavli. Yeah. And got in touch right. and got yeah. seven right. and a half million dollars right. from right. Kavli. Yeah. Well, th I was some overlap with this when I was in the dean's office. So I had a little bit of yeah. view from the center. And I got, did get asked questions about whether this was a good thing yeah. to do yeah. for yeah. physics yeah. at Stanford. Yeah. And then I said, look, Bert. Sandy and I all knew it had to happen. Yeah, now yeah. it's happening. Yes, yeah. we do need to do yeah. this, and I think most of the yeah. groundwork's yeah. been laid. And now we're operating as a very intelligent university. <laughs> <laughs> and these are courageous mm. moves and moves that are enormous value yeah. to every part of physics at Stanford. Yeah, no, it's... Well, uh, it's, it's, you know, and then we, we had, I mean, I mentioned that there was this separate but oversight joined at the hip two visiting committees yep. around 2000 because yes. that's when I was director of GLAM and yes. they they kept harping on two particular questions one was why is physics and applied physics separate yes and the other one what is the role of the independent laboratories and why aren't they destructive to the role of the departments yeah. And well, that's an interesting question. It is. And, uh, and there were lots of good answers about it. Well, I was about to segue to that <laughs> topic, and you played well, it in my one, hands. Well, the one answer that I valued particularly, there was one session with the directors of the independent labs. I was there for GLAM, and uh, David, what's his name? Miller. Miller came from Bell Labs, was director of Ginston, right. and I don't remember who was director, probably Bob Beyer was director of Heppel, and we all sat there. And David Miller, God bless him, said, you know, the real value of the independent labs, just to give it to you, I wouldn't have come from Bell Labs to Stanford if it hadn't been for the Ginston lab, because yeah. the ability to work separately from the department and, and not feel you're tied to research activities that only what Double E wants was a huge benefit, yes. and I thought that was yes. a very powerful statement. And I kept saying, look, the fact that we have, in the Jabal Laboratory, we have physics and applied physics and a whole bunch of terrific new young material, material science, science people yeah. all working together, and from the students' point of view, they're indistinguishable. Yeah. And, and they write papers together, they write proposals together, yeah. they share students, they share instruments. Yeah. Well, let me go back just a little bit in this, and, and, and uh, I think <clears throat> uh, the, how would I pull it, I put it, I mean, the evolution somewhat proliferation of independent labs that has occurred in the last decade or so. And I'm, I'm, I'm sure that the dean of research has a long list of what are considered independent labs, but let's stick to the ones in physics. I mean, SSRL sort of grew out of SLAC. I mean, it, it was yeah. a part of SLAC, but it, it, it functioned in some ways like an independent lab no, it, without, it, without it, having that title. It, 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 it was SSRP. Project, yes. Project, yeah. uh, and Bert encouraged the synchrotron beam being used, and uh, people came to use it, and it operated originally as a, what do you call it? I mean, it, it got, it was a parasite. It didn't have independent beam time. Right. And then after a few years, there was independent beam time. Right. And then as they grew, they became more independent, they ran their program, they bought beam time, were guaranteed it, from from the uh, uh, the the original uh, colliding ring, and they became the labs SSRL mm -hmm. within that's right administratively that's within right. Slack. That's right, yeah. but they 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 were administratively, I guess, for business purposes, organizational. But they ran their own program. Yeah, at that point, and yeah. that's when they grew and they kept it, growing. I was told it took years. Maybe it still hasn't happened to have a, a single joint faculty meeting between Slack faculty and SSRL faculty. Oh, and now now the there are two faculties out at SLAC. There is the PPA, uh, uh, Particle and uh, Physical ast and Particle Astrophysics, and then the Photon faculty. But they have this very strong, talented leader out there now. <laughs> well, <laughs> anyway, they have... Your they, daughter. <laughs> they, have, they do have two faculties now, and they do have joint meetings. Good. I think, I think that was uh, something of the last decade. Yeah. 
last six years, in fact. Well, I think that th th I'm sure there were issues out there, but, but there always are. But but that evolution, you know, yeah. bumps occasionally, yeah. but it happened in a natural yeah. way. Again, That's just my... to go back to the very beginning, evolution is a great process. <laughs> it, the trouble is, and th we'll save this for the end, but when all of a sudden there comes a big jar, a big earthquake, insecurities grow. Come, yeah. And then people in dealing with each other begin to distrust each other. And then right. they begin to dis insist upon right. Philadelphia lawyers writing in detail. Yeah. Yeah. You can do A, but not B. And that's where all the problems start. Yeah. And th so the slack was extraordinary challenge to this process, coming so big and uh, people weren't prepared for it in yeah. any way. Well, let me, let me uh, uh, Sandy, you can <clears throat> uh, fill in where I may get it wrong or forget. Uh, but the, I think the next uh, physics, m phys at least physics, physicist at Stanford uh, uh, initiative was, came out of the microwave lab, which had grown up uh, uh, to include uh, kind of a condensed matter group and an yeah. optics quantum electronics group, which always got along and do to this day. There was never any, I think, tensions between yeah. the, those two communities other than the microwave lab was small. And so the question was, if we're to have larger materials effort, and there was a group of us, including Sandy, who felt that was inevitable and a very good thing to do, and that I think we were correct in that judgment, looking where we are now. Uh, but there was a problem because there had to be space. And uh, I think this was, uh, 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 and, and I think the other important point is that the microwave lab from its foundation or its creation <clears throat> had uh, built its independent lab nature by combining people in physics and, uh, and electrical yes. engineering. There was a little bit to material science, but that really was the intellectual uh, connection that was considered the most important. <clears throat> and, um, uh, and I think what happened was when the materials area came along, then that it wasn't as if there was no connection to electrical engineering, but there was more of a connection to material science. So it was still in the school, there was still, uh, uh, well, let's put it this way, the, the, the School of Engineering was not happy about that development. I think that uh, uh, Jim Gibbons saw more of a development in computer science and in the Center for Integrated Systems and that kind of thing and was not a strong proponent of the material science department, which frankly would have gotten weak. So, I mean, uh, so he was not sympathetic to this. But nonetheless, uh, uh, I think under Bob Byer's leadership, who was then dean of research with, I think, the support of uh, uh, Don Kennedy, who was then the president, they said, well, okay, let's see if we can build a new materials lab. And it was called the Advanced Materials Research Lab, a AMR. AMR. And <clears throat> um, uh, that didn't happen uh, for uh, two reasons. One is it didn't have the support of the dean of engineering. It did have the support of the dean of H&S. And uh, my sense is that Don Kennedy supported it, but I'm not sure. But there was, a, there was also an issue of money. I mean, I think the university could not build the extension to the Center for Integrated Systems, which is now the Allen Laboratory, uh, and this AMR building, and they had to choose. And uh, they chose the CIS extension. Which I think is called, what Jim Gibbons certainly saw. Which is what Jim Gibbons, uh, so I, I, I don't, uh, J uh, Jim Ross made that decision. I don't know to this day exactly, maybe Bob Beyer does, why that was made. But then, so there was a kind of, uh, 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 the materials community was caught mm -hmm. with no obvious way to do what it felt it needed to do. Uh, and then a group of us said, well, okay, um, there was the notion cooking of this new campus, not, not the one we have finishing now, but the yeah. original SEQ. SEQ. And so then it was sort of clear that, uh, well, at least the possibility was, uh, was not silly to talk about that uh, the McCullough building might become available in a sense. Well, there was, and that's where the Center for Materials Research was. I remember there was money in principle from that SF well, that came later, but uh, the, so we said, um, a small number of us said, well, we're just going to go over there. 
we're going to move over there and try to maintain the Center for Materials Research, which was largely facilities. It was an independent lab, but not exactly the classic one. And then there were some good breaks. I mean, the, this Packard gift came and, and for the SEQ, and we, we got a million dollars from the NSF to renovate. Well, you and I had written a long, in the early 90s, we'd written a long proposal, 91, 92, 93, for this funding and how it would be done and how you should strengthen materials and we gave it to the provost. I guess that was just when Condi Rice became provost. Yes, and it sat that's right. In. It, we heard nothing for a year and suddenly then Casper announced that there was all this. SEQ. Hewlett, Hewlett and Packard were right. giving $77 million for this new science and engineering quad and we were told that suddenly there would be a new building which became the Moore building and well, that, be, that, was, that came about because if you would have material synthesis, you couldn't do it yeah. in McCullough. So, their, so their hands were forced a little bit on that one. Anyway, so that's, and we were very surprised when this suddenly, I was surprised when it suddenly resurfaced after a year of sitting in limbo. But it was a very happy outcome. Yeah, it was a happy outcome. I have to tell one Condi Rice story. I mean, to, to, to her credit, she was sympathetic to all of this and I think worked to try to do it. But she was a provost, and provosts have to worry about budgets and whatnot. And she was determined, and she can be strong-willed, that, okay, we're going to do this, and I, I believe in it, and I think she did. But it's, you know, it can't cost more than a certain amount. And that led to some incredibly funny situations. And I'll Short-sighted just, decisions. I'll, well, I'll just tell this one because it's so funny. So she, I was managing this, I was managing the communications with her all, over all of this and she announced to me that, well, okay, we can do this and that, but you're going to have to keep the old furniture. Now, that's, of course, absolutely absurd. The old furniture went back to the 1930s or whatever else. So I'm, I, I'm here to tell the story that uh, when they came to empty the building, they said, where do we take the furniture? And I said, take it to the dump. <laughs> I don't know that she, she, you know, she may have gone on before all that happened, and and uh, so we got our new furniture. That was my <laughs> very expensive new furniture. <laughs> very expensive indeed. new furniture. So anyway, um, now Kavli was the next, uh, I think, uh, over uh, next independent lab yeah. essentially to be well, created. Do you want to say what that looked like to you? I never thought of it as an independent lab. It is an independent lab Actually, because it's yeah. between SLAC and yeah, no, it's, HNS, it's, and that's two schools. There was a it, lot of. I, I know, but it really, well, again, if, if that's the definition, it's an independent lab. I mean, there is a faculty. The faculty is a joint faculty in the two departments. Yes. So they're, they're in the departments in that sense. Yes. And uh, their program is reviewed by the SLAC review scientific review panel, mm -hmm. council, or whatever mm -hmm. you call it. And so uh, what defines it as independent, I guess, is that some of its budget is independent of the slack budget. And the no, I think an independent lab, lab means here that it, it has faculty yeah. from yeah. two schools, yes, and, it, yeah. and therefore you have to report yeah. up yeah. through... Now, it could be yeah. the dean of research. In, in this case, it is, in some sense, yeah. the dean of research, but it's still administratively yeah. meshed... Yeah, okay, then it's an independent well, lab. Well, the fact that it has yeah, a separate yeah. building out at Slack. Yeah. Well, and on campus. And on campus. And the, the big push for getting a separate part of the building on campus was that otherwise the people would spend all their time at yeah. Slack. You never have a presence yeah, on campus. Yeah, no, I know that. Well, they also had to tear down Heppel. Yeah, yeah. 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 No, uh, you yeah. uh, know, I, I ceased being uh, deputy director in, what was it, 1998? And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm emeritus at that point. That shortly after, in fact, when is the official date of Kavli? Can you remind me? No, I, I just thought it was the early two thousand. Yeah. It's after, so I, I, uh, I'm, I'm not paid any attention to the management. Yeah, enjoy, I just enjoying your a, lack of responsibility. I remember being out there <laughs> yeah. in the early yeah. two thousands when yeah. they had yeah. groundbreaking for the building. Yeah, and uh, but I don't know when it was. I mean, I, I wasn't the there. slightly weird <laughs> thing is there was a lot of talk about joining into a single entity, Heppel and Kaipak. Yeah. And for whatever reasons, that yeah. wasn't done. Yeah. And yeah. I think Artie Bienenstock, yeah. when he was dean of research, yeah. made the decision that it would be simpler just to leave them. Yeah. And so when you go to this new building next yeah. to Varian, it specifically says Kaipak and Heppel. Yeah. 
rather than putting them under a yeah, single yeah. entity. Yeah. It, it certainly is working totally smoothly. I mean, as far as I know. Well, so is glam. I yeah, mean, I yeah. think once the. Yeah, I mean, frankly, I mean, the, 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 both Sandy and I at different uh, times yeah. as directors of yeah. glam had to tell yeah. that make yeah. the assertion yeah. that we controlled yeah. space in yeah. the building. Yeah. Other than that, yeah. I don't yeah. think. There but was I mean, let me talk about the program because the program is reviewed by the scientific policy committee, which reports both to the dean of research and, the, and to the vice president. The provost, and so the uh, the dean of research is there as as well as the vice yeah, president. Yeah, there you go. And so it's it's a seamless uh, arrangement. Yeah. Well, it's the vice provost and dean of research. Well. So yeah, right. Yeah. That's right. And they joint appointments are made, and uh, they're doing great work. And they have just money problems like everybody else. Right. <laughs> Let me. Uh, I think it's interesting to comment. <clears throat> it's it's not exactly the same kind of labs as we've been talking about. But when I was um, uh, dean of H&S, mm -hmm. which is when the discussions about forming the Clark Center were yeah. part of the, the, the discussions in the higher levels of the university. And, of course, the, the driver there, well, well, there are many, but I think the, the, the major one and the one that it was sold on was to create this link between the physical sciences, not yes. just physics, but and, the physical sciences and the, and the life sciences or biological yeah, sciences. That's right. And it was a it also links the School of Engineering, the School of Humanities and Sciences, yeah. and the, the medical school. Right. So that was the concept. <clears throat> what uh, and that happened. I mean I don't I don't know how well it, whether it's viewed as successful or not. Maybe it's probably way too soon to tell. But what I did want to say that's a little bit relevant to the discussions we've been having is the faculty in the biological science department of H&S had many of the same concerns and issues yes. and worries that the physics department right. had in the formation of SLAC. Yes. Had to do with, well, those guys don't. You know, they yeah. viewed it in the medical school a little bit the way right. physics yeah. viewed SLAC. Yeah. Well, these guys don't have to teach, you know, yeah, is yeah, that fair? Yeah, but yeah, we want to yeah. keep the teaching because they felt right. that would uh, help their defend their existence yeah. and so on and so forth, and I don't know to the degree to which that has been resolved as completely as I'm in the physics community. But I think the in in the I mention it, uh, and I you know what well, I, I had to, I yeah. used the well, I but, guess this is interesting. Yeah. I did use the the successful uh, repensement or whatever that we all experienced yeah. as that can happen. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and so I don't know exactly how it came out, but I thought it was interesting in the sense that we are trying here to discuss yeah. some of the yeah. Yeah. generic issues yeah. of independent labs. Yeah. So there are yeah. these, these issues yeah. that the, still the, the one advantage the Clark Building or the, with the BioX program has, mm -hmm. it is starting with faculty with joint appointments. Not the, totally. Not totally, but some. No, some. You, you have some. I'm thinking of Steve Block, for example. He's all, he's uh, biological sciences he's biologi and applied physics. Yeah. Well, biology and applied physics. Yeah, but that, that, but that's all within that had nothing has. to do with the Clark Center. In fact, he's oh, not thought, in the Clark Center. Oh, I thought he was. I didn't know. No, that. well, he was. To, he, there that, was never as much space for H&S as they'd be expected, is my understanding. Yeah. No, I know he's a problem with space. That I'm well, aware. it's a little more complicated I, I, yeah, than that. Never there there was, no, 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 it's interesting. I yeah. mean, this is about independent labs, yeah. okay? We're getting to recent history, so we have to be a little discreet, but... Uh, there was, uh, uh, I was part of the negotiations for, you know, you have to have yeah. some n sort yeah. of space assigned yeah. to yeah. the various units. Yeah. You can negotiate that later again if yeah. you want. But, and uh, so the, uh, the uh, two issues came up. One was that many of the biological science faculty who would naturally be, yeah. be uh, would be natural in that community were, somewhat hesitant about going over, but some of them decided to do it. Uh, but Steve Block was, had a foot in biology and in physics, and, and Steve Chu, who was in applied physics and yeah. physics as well, wanted to go over there. Well, now we came to uh, another uh, uh, bone of contention, and it's cultural partly, namely in the School of Engineering and in the medical school, yeah. they, can, they have a certain notion of how much space a faculty member needs to do research. Yes. Whereas in the physical sciences, that's a larger number. Yes. 
Now, the question was, well, you guys are just used to lots of space. And we said, well, no, we build our own equipment and so on and so forth. We don't use these facilities. So that became contentious in that building. And, and um, I, I don't want to speak for him, but I think, uh, as I understand it, Steve Block just got tired of this yes. argument and said, I'll go to biological sciences. My question is And Steve, too, went over to biology. My question is, is there a faculty in the Clark Center not in physics or biology? Well, there, there are lots in the medical, no, no. medical school and there are lots know, parts of medical of school or bi or bioengineering. I, I don't know. No, no, my point is, that is there appointments the, the, in, in the, 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 the people associated with it all come with departmental bases. Yes, that's different from Slack and PD physics department. When Slack was created, the people at Slack had no departmental base. That was the issue. Yeah, no, that's different. So a, and that was a much more serious problem. Yes. No, that, I, that's the point that's I want right. to make. Yeah, okay. That's my point. That's right. They well, all came from departmental bases, and it's sort of like the Center for International Security or Freeman Spogley Institute. Everybody there, not everybody, but people who are there, some of them have departmental appointments, but they get some of their salary. But you can be a and, fellow and, as and well. You're a fellow there. That's but right. But that, that has right. academic right. council status right. and so on and so that's forth. That's right. But you it's come quasi from faculty. Base. Yeah, and, we, and Slack did not come. That was the unique, really big. Well, and then problem. I think that was besides the size and, and the nature of it. But was it one of the reasons Slack was treated like a school. Yeah, yeah. but it, it made the relations more difficult. Yeah. That's all. I'm saying. Well, we're uh, we've just In segued end. into uh, yeah. I think the last thing right. that we want to do, and I think I'll just uh, go around the table. Yeah. I mean, um, to get. Yeah observations from each of yeah, us okay. on where we are, yeah, what the okay. future looks yeah. like, and, and some of yeah, these issues yeah. that still remain to be resolved. Yeah. Sid, do you want to go? Yeah, well, let me start, first of all, <clears throat> about what's happened to Slack. Uh, when Panofsky ad addressed the question of how long will Slack last, at the very beginning, <clears throat> he said Slack will last as long as we have good ideas. We're going to have to have an important new idea every 10 years if we want to survive. And this went from a linear electron accelerator bombarding targets to electron positron storage rings out of which SSRP and then SSRL grew, then into a, uh, a bigger ring, PEP, then into a uh, linear collider, that is having two beams collide but not a storage ring because the beams are made so small in volume and so intense in number. There, there, there's so many particles. You didn't have to recirculate to get a counting right. Then into a, <coughs> two asymmetric rings with different energy, the B factory, and now <coughs> it's using the accelerator as an injector <coughs> to make a into two some what are called uh, uh, undulators or wigglers to make these incredibly intense and tiny uh, beams of, uh, of of photons that uh, are now doing experiments on individual molecules, on processes at different times because they can take pictures as short as a few femtoseconds. So in terms of watching physical processes on the atomic scale, because that's the energy of the beam one's talking about, their wavelengths are comparable to atomic size. One can take sequence of pictures and make motion pictures. So the whole world has opened up. And in terms of, uh, you know, far away from high energy particle physics and one that has now faculties from almost every scientific department at Stanford working at it. Medical school, Using biology, it. chemistry, solid state physics, you name it. So it just shows you the evolution and the total integration into the university. So almost every now, there, appointment there was, now sorry. almost every appointment now is a joint appointment with some department. Well there are some contentions there, but 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 let, let me yes. there I think I have this right. Yeah. But the uh, uh, Slack is I don't know what owned quite means, but owned by the federal government yeah. and it's it's managed by or it's in D O D O E. Yeah. But it it's Manage its connections into DOE was moved from high energy physics to basic energy sciences right. a few years ago. Right. So that that mirrors the evolution yes, you're talking right. about. Yes. The government also made an adjustment. That, yes, no, that's right. I mean, the, and it went from a sort of yeah. I wouldn't call it single purpose, but a, a sort of more specified right. purpose now, to now general science. That's right. yeah, exactly right. right. 
So that, that that's that's you know the final vindication of what Slack could do for the university. I see. And the university <laughs> with this rich faculty in so many areas can do for Slack. That's a wonderful story. The second thing I would just comment on is uh, looking back at the beginning. I think it's important as we talk about some of the problems to recognize that the physics department had a had a sort of a philosophy. And one can understand it and, and uh, one can identify it as rational. Namely, that we are small as a physics department. We have several leaders in each field. We're independent. And that's the way we want to be. And we're afraid that when something orders of magnitude bigger in budget comes along, we could be you know, overpowered by a tidal wave of things. And so it was understandable that they <coughs> wanted to preserve a style that had permitted them to become an excellent department. Right. It's unfortunate that the pace at which this question and the intensity had to be addressed because once the the authorization was signed in 62 and Slack had to, had to start building, a lot of questions that the physics department had not been able or willing to really tackle came up and had to be resolved on a quick time scale. And that meant pressure. And that meant it became very difficult to have two negotiating groups talking to each other with mutual respect and trust. And in a certain sense, it was the pressure, the time pressure, to resolve the problem and, and build the staff at, Flat, at Slack, recognizing that we believed, and correctly, that you had to begin building with people at the top who were the A-team. Our success and the lack of success of the Cambridge Electron Accelerator, which MIT and Harvard viewed as being built more or less by a B team so that the A team at the universities could use it, that was never a success. The machine didn't operate that well and so forth. Slack was a huge step. It was a conviction that, and, and uh, a commitment when you had the largest scientific project. You had to assemble the A team, and we had to do that quickly. And it was absolutely, I think, un, without doubt, necessary that we could go out and get the best people as professors in the major universities and get, bring them to Stanford as professors. They would not come otherwise. But that had to be forced upon thinking in a time more rapid than, I'm sorry to say, the physics department could adjust. And it had to be a first-class position with didn't have to teach, but one had to have graduate students. That's very important to professors in their own scientific work. And so, unfortunately, a f compressed time scale led to great pressure, it 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 and it led to, in a certain sense, people negotiating, which sort of didn't have full trust in each other. It's a tragedy, I think. And it, so it started understandably, and with great support, what physics wanted to do, it, it, and fortunately, led to the fact that it couldn't be resolved without intervention and bad feelings. But I think 50 years later now, yeah. it's all over. Yeah. And that's the good story. Sandy? Well, I mean, the only, my only comment would be, I'm very impressed over the last 10 years how collegial physics and applied <laughs> physics has been. And, and the fact that applied physics has just had a search last year and is doing another one this year in any field of applied physics. Physics hasn't gone that far, but the physics department is highly respectful of everybody's yeah. needs, and so there is a long, there are evolving long-term plans, which is clear that they they want to satisfy what everybody yeah. needs, and it'll happen. And it's, I mean, we've been looking for an AMO search for ten Since years. I was dean. For <laughs> ten years, it's been frustrating, <laughs> but maybe maybe they'll actually make an appointment yeah. this year, and and yeah. I mean. There was one guy who could have gone either to physics or applied physics, who's now in applied yeah, physics. Yeah, he's a brilliant yeah, appointment. Yeah. I had lunch with him today. It's been a wonderful appointment, yeah. and he's terrific. Well, my, uh, my uh, <coughs> feelings are, I mean, I was a little bit outside and late to the, the, yeah. the serious issues that we've discussed. Uh, <clears throat> but I, uh, coming to applied physics, I mean, I, I like the microwave culture. And uh, that's one of the reasons that I came. And I think that the, 
uh, <coughs> as things evolved, the or time went on, and, and some of the tensions that you related to kind of were either resolved or, or wound down or, or people died or whatever. Um, the receptivity of the university to the physics community creating independent yeah. labs, and I'm not making a distinction yeah. so much now between yeah. Slack and the others, has been, uh, I think, uh, great for physics and certainly good for Stanford. And we've listed some of those labs. Each each had things. some yes. some birth pangs, yeah. uh, but if I go down that list, they're all very yeah. successful now. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's a tribute to Stanford. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, I think that um, uh, what uh, may still lie in the future is either the management of or the resolution of whether independent labs can make appointments and, and yeah, their students yeah, yeah, and so yeah. on and so forth. I mean, I have my own views on that, but that's I'm not making the decision, yeah. so I won't. Uh, but but I think yeah. that I think that there are some issues that are independent of the particular tensions yes. that yes. occurred in physics, which are really the, get to the core of the nature of the university yeah. Yeah. and, and yeah. its values and how it yes. operates. Yes. And I think uh, my own feeling is that that will play out yeah. and let's just hope it gets yeah. as well resolved as these and maybe 50 years from now. You know what? I welcome that tension because how you keep quality if you have interdisciplinary schools. If the tension is creative. That's right. No, <laughs> the point is, it's a tension that well managed can be created. Exactly. And, and, and as I said, it, the, and when it's not. It, yeah, the slack one was such a quick, overpowering one right away, it got out of hand. Yeah. And that was sad. I mean, another issue that still is contentious is who can be a PI? And that's that's been that's, a long term issue. That's right. Then but these, Stanford these has will its go own on. View. Well, I think all of us would agree that that we worked at toiled at that, at that bench, and now we'll leave it to a yep, younger generation. Right. Right. One of the great things about and, being emeritus. <laughs> exactly. Well, uh, yes, that's true, and we all are. Well, I want to thank you too. Uh, I hope this is uh, it, it is as much yeah. as a great value to those yeah, that watch yeah, it as yeah. it's been fun for us yeah, to do. Yeah, and I've learned some things and yeah. uh, whatever. And uh, my final word: I'd like to thank uh, the Stanford uh, History Society for uh, promoting this, uh, and uh, Slack for underwriting the uh, the filming. And did uh, we do that? I didn't know that. <laughs> and uh, Brad Plummer, uh, uh, who's uh, helped with the technical ends yeah. here, he's the multimedia communications yeah. manager at Slack, and uh, Stanford University Video Services yeah. for giving us this nice table. Yeah. And uh, I'm going to go home and, and, and claim that I'm now Charlie Rose, but uh, that won't get very far. But anyway, and uh, finally, I think we have to thank Pat Devaney. Oh, very, much, very so. much Who is terrific, uh, one of terrific. Stanford's great yeah. servants. Great. And uh, a, resource. a wonderful person yeah. uh, has lived in her way through a lot of this yes. uh, history yeah. uh, and in her inimitable way managed to get three retired faculty with impossibly yeah. complicated yeah. schedules together to do this. So thank you, Pat, <laughs> wherever you are. Good. And uh, so I think uh, meetings good. adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>